Good morning, everyone. We have a very busy agenda this morning, so if I get everyone to please take their seats and we will launch right into this. The, the plan for the morning, which will be very uh, packed filled with summaries and hopefully um, valuable discussion is as follows. Um, in, in a moment, I will turn the podium over to Francis, who will provide an overview of what has transpired, especially with respect to some recrafting of, of the plan and its structure. Following that, we will have three um, uh, summaries from representative uh, breakout group leaders from yesterday. We will have them each speak one after the other without any discussion between them, and then we will turn the entire uh, rest of the first half of the morning session into a discussion on each of the, the key components of the plan as well as any other comments people would like to make. We will attempt to break at 10 o'clock, and we do need to keep things fairly strict on timing. We will have a short coffee break, and then we will reconvene at 10.15 when we will get, as you will see up here, some summaries. I wouldn't dare. You will see, we will then have some, some very brief summaries from the special topics uh, groups from last evening, and then Francis will give a summary, and then uh, Dr. Zerhouni will be here to provide some closing remarks. So with that as the backdrop, uh, I will turn this over to Francis. Okay, well thanks Eric and uh, good morning to everybody. I'm glad to see that most of you did rec recognize that we were starting somewhat earlier today than we did yesterday, but I'm sure there's some people who are still over there sleeping thinking, oh, I've got another 45 minutes before they get underway and they're going to be very surprised when they turn up and discover we've already decided everything, but oh well. <laughs> the early bird, etc. cetera. Uh, so, um, Initially, as we set up this program, I was going to not plan to say anything until after we'd had the presentations from the breakout groups and the uh, special topic groups, and then I was going to try to summarize all of this along about 11 o'clock or so. But because things have changed fairly significantly in terms of the structure of the plan, and I think in a very good way, I thought it would be good to put that all in front of you now before uh, people get up and talk about specific areas uh, where the plan is going to focus, because otherwise we'll get all ca uh, ca caught up in this confusion about what is the structure of the plan anyway. Um, before doing that, I thought I'd show you this uh, lovely cartoon that Sharon Terry gave me yesterday, which seemed to be rather apt for what we're all about here. A Dilbert cartoon is always a good way to illustrate almost any gathering of people. <laughs> so you can see here that the guy with the pointy uh, uh, hair is saying, put together a team to decide who will be on the strategy council. Uh, Dilbert says, you want me to form a committee to create a committee that will produce a document that will be ignored? And uh, the answer is, no, it's a team to create a council. And uh, of course, uh, the guy with the uh, six hairs is saying, can I be on the team that ignores the document? <laughs> well, we're not doing that, people. <laughs> that may be somebody's world, but it's not the world we're in the midst of here at Early. And I might say, my goodness, uh, what a wonderful treat it has been uh, to have all of you so engaged in making sure we have a document that doesn't get ignored. <laughs> Uh, and I, I think that's one of the major lessons of this gathering is how invested uh, our community is in making sure that the plan that gets generated here really does capture the excitement, the enthusiasm, the potential of this field. And uh, frankly, I think many of you pointed out that the draft you were provided did not uh, catch you in that same uh, sense of capturing a lot of that enthusiasm, and that's something we can now fix. Uh, in that regard, uh, going from the uh, ridiculous to the sublime, uh, I want to give you one other quote here that uh, comes out of the uh, book of Proverbs. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. So I guess we must be then on the right track. We have many advisors, and we have a plan that will not fail. Okay, just to remind you, when we were all uh, starting here night before last, I put this charge in front of you, critique the draft plan in detail. You did it. Uh, <laughs> You said what you liked, uh, you said what you didn't like, you were quite free and open about that, <laughs> to the point where at least five people came up to me yesterday and said, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> to which my response was, well, of course I'm okay. This is the way the genome community does things. This is our, uh, our, our method of operating for the last 12 years, and it's wonderful. And the fact that everybody feels very comfortable weighing in on every aspect of this plan, including the overall structure, not just the details, 
is, I think, a wonderful uh, testimony uh, to the openness of this uh, particular kind of scientific dialogue, which has been our tradition. And I am very much okay. In fact, I'm uh, quite excited about this. Uh, you also pointed out what was missing. You paid attention to the grand challenges. And as I will come to in a minute, we've totally recrafted what a grand challenge is. It has a whole new definition. Because uh, the concept, as it was outlined in the original draft, it was felt by many people not really to work, and the challenges didn't necessarily fit. And we asked you on Monday night to think about interactions, and you pointed out that, in fact, the pillars was not a very good metaphor uh, for trying to encourage such interactions. And as you will see, in fact, you already have, if you picked up this page on your seat, uh, we've now really uh, changed the metaphor substantially in order to try to create uh, the kind of structure that emphasizes those interactions uh, as being critical. Uh, you all were pretty good about not wordsmithing and not promoting your own favorite hobby horse. The uh, breakout chair said they occasionally had to gong people for that, but not too often. In fact, it was interesting in some of the sessions I was in where people were specifically avoiding that to the point uh, where those who were most in favor of particular areas uh, were often those who didn't do them well. Again, we had started uh, this conversation with this document that phrased all of this in the context of these three pillars. There were pillar problems throughout the day yesterday. <laughs> no one really liked the metaphor. At least I haven't encountered somebody who said, oh, I love it. This is so good. It just captures exactly what I want to say. Uh, the interactions are very hard to depict. I mean, try to draw a diagram of pillars where you have connections between them, and you quickly have a diagram that makes people laugh instead of encouraging their enthusiasm. Computational biology is a specific example, uh, seemed to be underrepresented in the formulation that we put in front of you, and there was even a suggestion it needed its whole new pillar, and that didn't seem like that was quite the right answer. But it was an example of one of the areas that's really cross-cutting across everything we're trying to do, but which in the formulation that you saw uh, didn't really get captured very well. There was a tendency, I think a fairly broad one, for people to take that pillar called genomics to society and say, oh, that's the LC pillar. And that would be a very damaging way, I think, to view genomics to society and a damaging way to view the ELSI program. Certainly, there's a lot of uh, overlaps there. But the ELSI program, if it's going to be viable on into the future, and it must be, has to be interacting with all the levels uh, of genomics and closely interdigitated with the scientific enterprises that relate to basic biology and to human health. And to have it uh, perceived as being relegated off in this uh, separate pillar that's not connected to the rest uh, really was not the outcome we were hoping for. And we tried in the uh, document that you uh, looked at before coming here to make the distinction that LC and genomics to society were not one and the same. But I don't think we really succeeded, at least in many people's minds, that distinction did not uh, come across. And there was the question, OK, uh, if these are pillars, what are they holding up? And there are answers to that, but none of them were as satisfying as one might hope. So I think we basically had to decide we're not going to go there. <laughs> So we were in search of, uh, by uh, early uh, in the process yesterday, uh, other metaphors, uh, other ways of structuring this that would better capture all of the things that we're trying to promote. And in that regard, this is where this diagram uh, came to life. And for this, I give a lot of credit to a whole bunch of people. And I should stop right now, by the way, and say, you know, the breakout chairs uh, yesterday did a phenomenal job. Uh, these people who were called uh, to do what they thought was going to be a simple matter of leading a couple of discussions uh, were, in fact, drawn into intense discussions at lunch, another a couple of hours of discussion at the end of the afternoon sessions, and then were kept uh, in the Jefferson Room until quite late last night uh, trying to formulate all of this in a new fashion. And uh, it is uh, to their credit uh, that we got to the point that we are now, where I think we have actually a much more compelling way uh, to capture the excitement of genomics. So let me quickly walk you through this particular diagram, because as the other presentations come forward, they're going to be uh, referring to this. So instead of pillars, uh, we basically are building a structure here. And notice that down at the bottom is the foundation of that structure, which is the Human Genome Project, the success of the enterprise that has dominated the activities of NHGRI over the course of the last 12 years, and which is a wonderful foundation upon which we can now build uh, for the future, which is what this plan is all about. The first floor of this building uh, is genomics to biology. And you will recognize that that has some similarities uh, to what we used to call a pillar. But it's a lot more than just turning the whole thing 90 degrees. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a substantive set of changes here that I hope I can uh, point out to you. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Genomics to health is the second story. 
Genomics to society is actually in this particular image, and, and we may decide whether or not we think this works, but it's the roof. It is the top of the building. It is the thing upon which uh, it, that rests upon all the rest of it. Now notice what is really different here you know, than what we had in the original configuration, which I think is very compelling, are the uh, objects that are uh, written in uh, uh, vertical type and which cross across these levels. And by the way, uh, when we get the final version of this with better graphics assistance, we will make it clear that these levels interact with each other. I'm sorry, Eric. <laughs> Excuse me, yes. Excuse me. Eric, Eric Green did this lovely diagram. I think we should all applaud that. <laughs> just, just the same. There probably are few improvements that could be made <laughs> to, to uh, convey the connections between the levels, which might be nicely done with double helical staircases or something like that uh, when the time comes. Uh, but I hope you get the concept anyway. Uh, so notice here now, LCM policy is not the same thing as the genomics to society a roof of the building. It crosses all the levels, and well, it should. And ditto, there are other aspects of what we're trying to do here, which in some way were called in one of the discussions requisites, but they are part of the enterprise that allows one to actually reach the goal and the grand challenges under each of these uh, components. And you can see those include resources, that includes information science, which now gets much more uh, uh, attention than I think it did in the original formulation, technology and methods, education, which crosses all of these, and workforce issues. And uh, we could debate a bit about which of these belong at which level. Now, you can see here that we have uh, formulated in a fashion so that the uh, genomics to society component has a somewhat different list uh, than the rest of the uh, other stories. Uh, and that seemed to be where the group wanted to go last night, but that may be one of the things we could talk about. So I really like this because I think it does point out by using these two axes, uh, the floors, and then if you want to call these the supporting structures that are holding the building up, these cross-cutting areas, it points out uh, the difference between those two in a fashion that the pillar model really did not. So that's the structure upon which uh, the presentations are going to uh, now come forward. I just want to make a couple of other remarks, and then I'm going to uh, turn that over uh, to those group presentations. But again, just so that we don't get hung up on issues that I think we may have already gotten pretty close uh, to reaching some agreement about, uh, some other major points that were made about the new plan. The preamble is critical. Uh, everybody pointed out the difficulty they had uh, reading the document without quite getting the sense of why is this exciting, uh, what, what is it about genomics now that deserves uh, this kind of a planning process anyway, uh, what have we done so far, where are we going, and how does this fit in the context of what the rest of the world is doing? In that regard, the preamble uh, probably is not something that should be written by a committee of 160 people. Uh, it's probably something that needs to be done very carefully uh, by one or two very articulate persons. And that will happen, uh, hopefully with the help of Maynard uh, in particular, over the course of the next uh, couple of weeks or so. But I, I would like to say I, I heard a number of very important points that ought to be in this preamble that I'll just try out on you, and uh, we can perhaps uh, discuss it when we get to the discussion. First of all, the emergence of genomics as a central and cohesive discipline of biomedical research. Not a bunch of technologies, but a coherent and a compelling uh, discipline upon which all of this uh, now future structure is going to be built. That didn't come across very well in the current version of the document. The fact that this is a historic transition uh, from the unqualified success of the very explicit goals of the Human Genome Project, as outlined uh, 12 years ago, uh, to this new era of discovery, uh, which is going to be a real transition and one that we should celebrate, and which involves now a unique opportunity to explore radically new approaches that will benefit human health. And I think we want to be very clear in that preamble that we're very interested in those, uh, that this is, in fact, an opportunity to focus much more in the direction of health advances. And I think that preamble must also point out that just as at the beginning uh, the Genome Project uh, focused some of its attention on the societal consequences, that we're at least as in interested, in fact, much more so, in making sure that that is a component of what we do. And finally, I think the preamble has to make it much more clear how NHGRI fits into the scheme of things that we aim to be a leader in the central core of genomics activities uh, that uh, we'll enumerate this morning, 
But that is not the whole story here. We also aim in as vigorous a way as possible to be a partner with many other public and private entities, including all the other institutes of NIH, other government agencies, uh, the private sector, private foundations, and so on. So that is a bit of a comment on the preamble. Um, let me also say something about grand challenges. You'll see on this document that the grand challenges now appear in each of the floors of the building in a rather different way than they did in the draft that you looked at uh, before coming here. So we're redefining grand challenges this morning uh, to be basically those elements uh, under each of the goals uh, that uh, involve the, the greatest sort of core activity uh, uh, things that the Genome Project and NHGRI can do uh, to advance this field. And many of them you will recognize are, have some relationship to what we called critical elements in the prior version. The grand challenges in the prior version were largely uh, the ones that seemed most successful, uh, technological advances, such as sequencing a genome for $1,000 or some such thing. And I think we would actually like to go to that uh, very same descriptor. I'll come back to that other one in a minute. And perhaps add a new component uh, to the plan in this new version, which we could call, uh, for lack of a better term at the moment, quantum leaps in technology, making it clear that those really are technological goals that, if achieved, would dramatically alter the way we do research or practice medicine, but which are in the technological zone, and therefore will probably fit particularly well with the bottom floor of this house and maybe a little bit with the second floor as well. But it'll keep us from having to uh, force uh, the grand challenge in the old way uh, uh, model uh, in circumstances where, frankly, it didn't fit as well. And so now, again, I hope I'm not confusing you, the new definition of the grand challenges are really those core critical elements under each of the goals. Um, there was much concern about the way in which the document was written uh, that confused people in terms of who would have the responsibility of pursuing particular parts of the enterprise, and particularly so when it came to the elements that were marked with the pound sign or the squiggle, uh, because they were all sort of put together there on lists, uh, which made it seem as if uh, they were of equal intensity importance in this document. And while they are equal, uh, many of them equal in terms of the long-term uh, hoped-for future of the consequences of genomics, I think there is a strong feeling that this document has to do a better job of shining a bright light on the areas of genomic research that NHGRI is particularly well-suited to take the lead on. And while commenting and encouraging uh, these other areas of partnerships uh, with other entities, they should perhaps be placed in somewhat of a different format in the document and perhaps in a separate part of the document as part of a sort of uh, a uh, background and significance section, as someone suggested. And I think we can do that uh, in a fashion that still captures the importance of those partnerships, but makes it clear uh, which of the areas of the future of research are really the central core and focus of this document, which is what I think people are looking for, which is what NHGRI aims to do in this next phase. So those are the background uh, items that I wanted to put in front of you before we got into the presentations, and I think we'll hold discussion on all of that until we've heard uh, from those uh, three groups that have labored uh, to come forward with their new uh, version of this. And again, thanks to them for doing so on the fly in a circumstance where we had a fairly substantive revision uh, going on all day yesterday and last night. So without further ado, um, I guess Eric Lander is next, and please come forward, and you've got the PowerPoint on there, too. May I help you that? Yeah. First floor. So, I'm going to report for the first floor, previously the first pillar, that uh, Arvind and I each chaired uh, two of the discussion groups. Uh, let me briefly report the substance, and I think uh, this is true for our Vinda's group as well, there was uniform and I think almost unanimous enthusiasm for the science, for the scientific opportunity, for how exciting it was. And there was equal uniform sense that the document didn't convey that, but that we needed to draw out and sharpen the focus. But in a very productive discussion, both in the morning and the afternoon in these two groups, the idea of getting a clear, crisp goal clearly emerged, the idea of defining these requisites more explicitly, and the group really felt strongly about the role of the information sciences, about education, about ELSI, about resources. The group spent a bunch of time paring away some things that were felt to be inessential, 
and spend some time with a very productive discussion on, of course, we all want to understand the function of components, but function means so many things to so many different people. And particularly in the afternoon, there was a very good discussion about making crisp and precise what level of functional description was appropriately genomic and what level of functional description was writing in, you know, detailed cell, cellular biological papers. Um, that was the, I can't, I won't go into all the specific many comments. We've recorded all of them. There's full transcript, well, not quite transcripts, but at least full extensive minutes of, of all of those discussions that will be very valuable in preparing a written report. But what we did was try to abstract that discussion into three slides. Here are the three slides. The first was a simple statement of a goal that you could tell anybody that floor, it's not floor one, um, whatever we're calling it. It's, a, it's a first floor. floor. The first floor. The first floor. Um, is, has as its goal the comprehensive and comprehensible. That, that involves beta presentation and understanding and many other things. Um, comprehensive and comprehensible characterization of all the components encoded in the human genome, as well as other important organisms. That's it. What does that mean in terms of the grand challenges associated with that goal? Seven. All of these are comprehensive. Here. Sorry, my mic's not viewed back here. Do I need a mic? Yeah. Oh, wow. Not for anybody, not for anybody in Virginia. But anybody okay, but outside of the state of Virginia. That's what I, I was, I so rarely need a mic. So this is not, usually I have the opposite problem. Um, comprehensive identification of all the functional and structural components encoded in the genome. There are many thoughts today about the best ways to do that. Amongst the best ways today, for example, would be the sequencing of dozens and dozens of related organisms and using evolution to pick those things out. But of course, the choice to sequence many dozens of organisms or hundreds of organisms is instrumental to identifying the components in genomes or some of these other things. There are also other approaches to identifying all the functional and structural components encoded in genomes. There's the comprehensive description of the key functional properties of these components. That doesn't mean a total description of all biological function, because we don't know how to do that. But key functional properties include expression, where they're expressed, when they're expressed in health and disease, interaction amongst these components, protein interactions, or interactions between proteins or other things and DNA elements, and dependencies, when you systematically knock some of these things out in, in uh, appropriate circumstances, what things change in response to those. But this is not the same thing as totally understanding biological function. This is the genomic contribution to functional characterization. Comprehensive description of heritable variation in these components. Comprehensive description of biological variation, epigenetic modification, covalent modifications. Comprehensive description of evolutionary variation across the species who's changing rapidly, slowly, and why. Compliment. Why is, of course, always tough in evolution, so we don't fuss too much about it. But, um, comprehensive ability to monitor these components. A heavy technology component is going to be necessary to monitor those. And a comprehensive ability to modulate these components, such things as RNAIs and, and um, that should be chemical, uh, chemical genomics. That's it. This, if we can accomplish that, if we can make those comprehensive tools, <laughs> the feeling was that this will have then provided a tremendous foundation for the rest of biology, including for the second floor and the third floor. Obviously, as with the Genome Project, making precise some of these descriptions has to be had. The word comprehensive doesn't mean completely exhaustive. It doesn't mean we would necessarily have every possible variation in the genome but such a comprehensive view that there would be relatively little return to getting every last one of them or something. So anyway, there are a bunch of bullet points under, under, under the previous pillar one. We felt many of them were just fine, but they should be arranged under a, a thinking like this. What are the requisites in order to do that? The requisites have to do with technologies, resources, information science, and policy. The requisites, some of them under technology have to do with describing, some with modulating. For describing, this is where the need for extremely rapid, inexpensive sequencing uh, comes, because we believe that, that sequencing is a powerful technology for being able to do some of those goals. So we have to be able to do de novo sequencing, resequencing, genotyping, which is, of course, a kind of sequence determination. This is where the hopes for $1,000 genomes and quantum leaps would go. Whole, the whole transcriptome, already such things are possible, but they need to be much better. Whole proteome, such things are not currently possible and need to exist. And for modulating, to ensure that the development of such technologies are, as RNAIs and chemi chemical genomic libraries really advance and proliferate. Resources to make sure that the reagents that emerge from this, example, cDNA collections and chemical libraries, 
are created in a form that they can be broadly disseminated, uh, so they actually are useful and disseminatable. Information sciences, something is off the bottom of that. Um, information sciences, uh, professional warehousing of large data sets needs a lot of attention. This is a topic we never really discuss much, but it's worth mentioning because it probably in the end may be the key. Professional architecture in order to allow the reuse and interoperability of software so everybody isn't writing their own Smith Waterman aligner. But you can, for example, use a web services architecture and go off and pull down a Smith Waterman aligner as a module in the thing you're writing. We don't do that and we waste much of our time rewriting stuff. Um, and, and therefore also our stuff's not interoperable. Data analysis and interpretation, data dissemination and visualization, and pathway and system modeling come under that. And then policy, it's cut off at the bottom here. Let me see if I can escape out of that and pull this up. Is that? Um, but it's to ensure the broad access to, uh, no, there's a couple more lines in here. Let's see if it comes up. No, maybe not. That's a Mac, it's a poor PC thing. Anyway, ensure broad access to <laughs> data resources and technology. And the issue here was data availability was a crucial thing. Freedom to operate, that is the IP issues around being able to, for example, use all the proteins in the genome or something like that re requires attention, not just that the data should be available or the resources should be available, but that the legal ability to operate with those should be available. And the same access to technology. Those are the things that have to be addressed under that policy uh, bullet. That's it. Education was also cut off the bottom. Education and workforce were also cut off the bottom of the slide. Great. Francis points out that right, here I'll just do this. that was below that. Okay. Well, I think that uh, that Eric's uh, description actually demonstrates why the notion of floors makes a lot of sense. Because in fact, the the floor of genomics to health and disease builds very strongly on um, on the floor that uh, Eric just built. Um, first of all, we do have fairly uh, uh, we have fairly broad goals here. Um, we want to identify all the genes and pathways that contribute to health and disease. And then we want to develop interventions that are going to um, that are going to address that are going to address those uh, to promote health and prevent disease. That's a fairly audacious set of goals. Um, and rather than talk about grand challenges, uh, uh, at least Rick, uh, I should by the way acknowledge that Rick Lifton um, was the other group leader and uh, was incredibly instrumental in help formulating this particular presentation and document. Um, but I think both of us sort of think that what we really are talking about here is, is developing pathways to achieve these goals. And there are two main points here that I want to bring forth. One is that all the groups thought that more attention needed to be uh, devoted to single gene disorders than are currently reflected in the document. Um, and we think there are a number of reasons for this. We think that single gene disorders may provide insights into other complex diseases, but also that that it's an important obligation to deal with particularly rare single gene disorders, and that we, although other institutes also do this, that NHGRI ought to be involved with this as well. Um, we also did endorse the notion that uh, NHGRI ought to be engaged in the pursuit of trying to find the genomic contributions to common complex diseases. But we felt very strongly that this ought to be um, in, in a partnership mode. Um, this has already been alluded to, but this is an area where this really comes, um, comes to the fore very uh, clearly. Uh, first of all, because NHGRI, while it has enormous expertise in thinking in terms of um, genomics and the whole um, organism, um, does have, there are other areas of expertise with which NHGRI, in all its wisdom, doesn't have quite so well, like epidemiology and some of the complex phenotyping, um, and that there were enormous opportunities for partnering here. At the same time, what we thought was that NHGRI ought to be very strategic in terms of thinking about what the paradigms are for using genomic approaches to approaching complex diseases are, and then be very careful in picking 
model projects in which to explore whether these paradigms actually work and if they do actually work to demonstrate um, their ability to give new insights into the etiology of disease. So that was a reformulation of what we thought that uh, the NHGRI could do. Now, what do we need to do this? And I think this is uh, where we rely very heavily on the tool set that Eric just described, um, because clearly there needs to be a lot more work, um, better, better, faster, cheaper technologies in a whole variety of ways. Um, and then, but we would move to a couple of new levels in terms of thinking about information systems that I think are particularly important here. Um, one is that there needs to be a more integration of genomic data sets and clinical information data sets. Um, and not only that, but when people collect well-characterized cohorts, that there needs to be a mechanism that these can be shared with other investigators um, so that people don't keep collecting the same or similar cohorts over and over and over again. Now, we recognize that there are a lot of barriers to having this happen. Um, some of them are legal, like HIPAA um, and uh, other issues. Um, some of them are, frankly, institutional, and we hark back to Bob Tepper's early comments about the fact that there are serious institutional incentives that get in the way of this, but this ought to be something that's very important um, for a genome to address. The third thing that genome, I think, needs to address in a very clear way, and this um, is going to come back again in the context of education, is the development of of, of tools that allow the investigate, that integrate currently existing data sets, genomic data sets, clinical data sets, in ways that are accessible to investigators and accessible to researchers in a way that can be very helpful to them in their research and in terms of doing their clinical care. There is a lot more work of integrating across data sets that needs to be done that would be very important. Um, we also identified the need for better animal models because Although we are, the goal here is human health, that uh, clearly animal models have contributed and will continue to contribute a lot to our understanding of disease. Um, Elsie and policy, we had a number of points to make here, um, some of which Eric has also already alluded to, but I'll make a few more. Um, one is that clearly research ethics is going to play an enormous role here, um, not only in terms of uh, not only in terms of the legal issues, but just also in terms of the public acceptability of this research, not only in the United States, but abroad. Um, the issue of helicopter genetics was raised, and I think this is something that we have to take very seriously as we talk about um, collaboration around the world. Um, another issue that we talked about was the need to address issues of privacy. I suspect this will come up in Wiley's presentation, but, um, but I um, just raise it again. Um, we also, I think not surprisingly, spent a fair amount of time talking about semantics and about what this document claimed and didn't claim and about the importance of wording and what we talked about. Um, and one of, the mo one of the most helpful comments that was made yesterday in one of my groups was by Alan Williamson, where we talked about, you know, what are genome-based interventions um, and what does that mean? And what we realized is that what we are more concerned about here is genomically informed interventions rather than um, genome-based interventions, because that, suggest, that leaves open the possibility or the reality that environment broadly writ also influences almost all of human health as well as whatever genomic variation is. Um, and then we also identified that there's the need to uh, be careful about what we suggest that genomics can do and be careful not to overclaim, but also not to underclaim. Um, that we need to be open to exploring the role that genetic variation plays in all disease um, and across all contexts. Uh, the final issue that we spent a fair amount of time talking about with ed was education. Um, and one of the points that was made at length yesterday was that this is, e um, th this is even more complex than people think. Um, and that you know, we talk a lot about complexity, but it's even more complex because typically when we're dealing with real patients, they don't just have one health issue. They have a lot of health issues. And not only that, they interact with each other. And while this is something that is part and parcel of what real clinicians do, nonetheless, this is going to raise it to a new level of complexity. And so we, I think, need to, um, we need to take a leadership role in doing this. 
Um, and I think part of what this means, and this goes back to my notion about information <coughs> systems, is that we really are going to need to take the leadership role in developing expert systems that help both clinicians and patients um, sort through the information that they're going to be getting to help them make better decisions for themselves about what interventions they're going to make that's going to improve their own health. Um, and I also uh, want to say that we, uh, that we also recognize the incredible ongoing importance of educating the public. Uh, there was a considerable debate about how much of a role NHGR ought to take in that, as at least as a part of its extramural program, but clearly um, it is a central issue for the long term. Let me just mention one or two LC um, items that did not make it onto my slide, but the, that are enormously important. And then I will hand over the mic to Wiley. Um, and the final point that I just want to make here is that we also acknowledge that the issue of access is extremely important. Um, it's extremely important for any number of reasons. It has to do with the acceptability of the research. It has to do with justice. It has to do um, with uh, distribution across societies and around the world. Um, these are issues that are going to be extremely difficult to solve. Um, but they are ones that, that NHGRI needs to continue to um, devote a lot of attention to as it moves or forward into the new era. So in presenting um, the uh, Genomics to Society piece, uh, I'm speaking for Sharon Terry, Raynard Kington, uh, Joy Boyer, and Jean McEwen, all of whom uh, labored late into the night trying to put a roof on this house. Um, we're uh, trying our best to reflect the discussion uh, that occurred in all of the groups. And um, what I think we found was that most of the issues that were identified in the critical elements uh, did hold up as important issues, and we've tried to reflect them in the framework that we're providing here, um, but that we really needed to avoid uh, a stance of react reactivity. Um, that is, that issues of genomes to society need to be framed as important issues, not merely as reactions to, uh, to things going on as a result of genomic research. And there were many comments in the groups uh, that the way the document was written uh, seemed to imply a stance of genetic determinism that, that we knew really wasn't supported or intended. Um, so we identified the goal as to identify uh, and address the pressing societal implications of genomics. And uh, we've uh, divided the challenges into two general categories of research. Uh, foundational research and policy-related research. Uh, there's an important uh, 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 concept behind pre presenting this as a research agenda, and that is the recognition that NHGRI is not a policy-making body, and yet many of the issues that arise in genomes to society relate to the development of policy. So the question becomes, what is the NHGRI role? And as you see here, we're formulating that as a role in research that deals with basic questions, those are the foundational issues, and that research informs a more applied kind of research that we're calling policy-related. Um, so uh, examples of foundational research uh, involve analyzing the impact of genomics on concepts of race and ethnicity, on concepts of normality, uh, what do we mean by normal, particularly in context of different kinds of conditions, attributes, or behaviors that might be influenced by genomics. Uh, and uh, implications uh, for genomics for concepts of culture, family, and self. Um, and, and this kind of research could be approached by qualitative and quantitative data collection, by normative and non-normative analysis, by other kinds of uh, uh, endeavors, historical analysis, for, for example. And then in policy-related research, what we're defining is uh, very specific, and that is that this research should define policy options. So NHGRI is not a policy-making body, but it is extremely appropriate to identify what the policy options are and subject different policy options to analysis that could, again, 
both be based on empiric research or other analytic methods because as we look at different policy options we want to look at their potential societal consequences we've identified for that we think are the leading issues you'll see that there's redundancy here but I think that's expected redundancy with policy issues identified in the other on the other floors so use of genetic information in non health care settings clearly is an issue access to health care services it comes under genomes to health but it is really broader than just achieving health care outcomes it has major societal implications same with IP and then another issue that received a lot of attention in the initial draft and we think is important to address is what are the policy options in terms of identifying and then potentially implementing limitations based on ethical considerations on genomic research now in addition to the challenge of addressing those issues we think there's a challenge in creating a sort of process challenge if you will of creating the right kind of structure to make this happen and we've outlined on this slide what we believe are the critical elements so as I've said first of all there is the concept of accomplishing research both foundational and policy related and we see those research efforts is very interactive but one of the points that we would emphasize is that every research effort in this area should have a plan for dissemination and the plan for dissemination may be publication in the foundational research it may be only publication but certainly on the policy related side we have to look critically at what kind of dissemination are we looking for who are the right target audiences and how best could they be informed about this these kinds of policy options and dissemination is likely to take a form much beyond publication in scientific journals equally important we think is to create an evaluation process and this evaluation process will require a new methodology we think an early important effort will be to think about the kind of expertise that ought to be around the table in creating that kind of evaluation process because we think it's critical to the success of this kind of effort that evaluation should in an ongoing fashion look at the relevance of the topics that are being addressed in foundational and policy related research there ought to be an ongoing assessment are we looking at the pressing topics have we missed something it should look at the productivity of the effort what's coming out are we in fact identifying policy options in an appropriate and efficient manner and it it needs to look and begin to think about the creation of perhaps a variety of mechanisms that look at the outcomes that might be relevant to measuring genomics to society can we for example create surveillance mechanisms that might look at utilization of genetic tests and tell us where the live issues are in terms of potential misuse of genetic tests or under use of genetic tests can we identify effective means for tracking measures that might give us some indication of whether genetic discrimination is is an issue obviously having come to some definition of genetic discrimination that we can support equally important to evaluation is this critical issue and critical for this floor and all floors in this plan who does it part of the plan has to be in a plan of inclusion that is an aggressive effort to bring into this process researchers from diverse backgrounds that includes researchers from minority and underserved backgrounds and that that has an implication in terms of training programs and recruitment efforts but also a very broad skill set in order to accomplish this kind of system well we are going to need to bring in a lot of research disciplines that aren't currently a prominent part of an HGRI and this really just summarizes what I've been telling you and just points out that we really see ourselves as having three segments if you look at the strips to the right on the floor one is LC policy that is identifying the foundational and policy related research questions under education we think there is this dissemination piece that I've just described and as I mentioned there's a workforce piece that is critical here as in other areas and that's it thanks okay thank you Wiley actually thank all the speakers for keeping things on 
Yeah, thanks. All the, and, and already under budget. So we'll now we'll, we'll turn the floor over for discussion, and we pr have precisely one hour for discussion. Maybe in the interest of keeping things uh, somewhat organized, I thought what we would do is take a few questions on, on sort of the first pillar, first floor, then we'll take a few questions on the second, a few questions on the, on the roof for the third, and then we'll open it up for a sort of general cross-cutting kind of questions, comments. Actually, it's also for comments. The speakers are all in the front row. I can hand a microphone to them if you want a direct sign to them. And please line up at the three microphones that we have, one in each aisle. Oh, excuse me. Okay, thank you. Chuck Langley, UC Davis. Okay, so <laughs> sorry. Um, um, I'm I I am looking for something in this document that builds on the history of the genome project, which is a very definable goal. I realize that this document reaches beyond five years, but I still think all the more reason to have a very clear well-defined goal, and I would like to propose that we reconsider the issue of resequencing a number of human genomes. The reason for that is two completely, rather than making a catalog of variation, because there are two very important reasons to do that. First of all, we all know that the haplotype map is while quite useful for picking low-lying fruit, may not be adequate, and certainly is not an endpoint like sequencing the human genome was. And secondly, in order to drive sequencing technology and to really get to the $1,000 genome, we need to have large, well-focused projects based on sequencing that are out there driving the interest and the justification for developing that technology. And I see that missing from this document. I think it's just that you don't see it in the document. But a comprehensive description of the characterization, that means the resequencing of genomes because to characterize the variation, it means knowing all of the variation there. It's not haplotype maps, it's not, we, all of that is out of there. In fact, if the best way to obtain that is complete resequencing, then that is, and I think probably that is, that's contemplated. We tried to say, why are you doing it? And you're doing it to try to get the complete characterization of all the variation, meaning the different sequence. Is the complete characterization of human genome? Well, but no, but I, I think the reason we didn't put in comma based on the complete sequencing is if there's another way to do it that turns out to be better, fine. But we don't think there is one right now, but we're trying to distinguish between the scientific goal that we're trying to achieve and then below it in each of the paragraphs will be what is likely to be the very best way to get it, which is indeed those bullets that were there and, and we agree. Okay. That please, was at least please, a please address the strategy issue, though, about having a definable goal that drives technology development. Right. There are strategy issues underneath, but the scientific goals got called out on top. Historically, the strategy issues were up above in driving technology. No. In I don't think so. No. I don't think so. I, I think the, the scientific goal was above. Uh, uh, perhaps what's missing and that prompts Chuck to ask that question is a uh, lack of quantitative goals. Uh, uh, I mean, are they, we just didn't see them yet, or so. so these, these how many the genomes bullets. and when, and this this kind of uh, specificity. So, how many genomes and when for a ten-year document? The, the sense of the group was was not appropriate. That in fact, it was to define comprehensively the the functional and structural elements of genomes. Current thinking is that's going to take dozens of mammalian genomes, et cetera, et cetera. But if a technology came along, Richard, the group felt that allowed you to find those structural and functional elements with sequencing no more organisms, that's great too. So sequencing dozens of more organisms was not regarded by the group as an end in itself. It was regarded as almost surely the most likely and productive way to do it. But yeah, again, so the focus was on the, the end. So uh, clearly there's a middle ground here, and I think that the, the sentiment may be that the document has shifted over to uh, being a little squishy because it's not, it's, it's not uh, it's not being quantitative at all. So I maybe didn't convey the very concrete nature of, of these discussions. There's no backing off from below it saying, today it appears that we have to sequence 25 genomes, et cetera, like it already says in the document. But the point is, why do we have to sequence 20, 25 genomes? Because we believe it is the way to accomplish this. 
And the document was restructured by both of the groups so that these activities that we all agree are very important activities are there in a context of why. But there's no backing off on many of these things there. They're simply arranged under their motivations. And there is a recognition that if five years from now there's a better way to accomplish it scientifically, our allegiance is not really to the activity. But at the moment, these activities we agree on. I'm sorry if I need to bail. If everybody could please introduce yourselves since this is being webcast elsewhere and so forth. Okay, I'm Ian Bernie from the EBI. Just to remind everybody, there's not going to be a very nice, clean goal like sequencing the human genome that we can point to. I think that's a frustration from the two previous questions is that we can't just point at something scientifically that we, you know, it's this sort of fuzzy, we want to know lots more about lots of things, which I personally think is, I mean, I agree with all the statements. I just, I think we're going to come across this problem again and again that we can't find a very, very well-defined goal. And we have to accept that and come up with goals that we can set ourselves that are what we want to get to. So we just, it's just part of this process. Can you even jump up and try to, so in three slides we left out many things. If we don't have every last nucleotide in the genome, there still was a sense that you can tell that you're approaching saturation. When in fact, it's not possible to define lots of new structural and functional elements as you add other organisms or try other techniques. You have a sense that you have begun to produce a comprehensive catalog. And when you're still adding at every single moment, you're far away from it. So if it's not quite as crisp as the last nucleotide, it's not totally fuzzy either. So the way I view this is that the data sets should be both comprehensive and qualitatively change the way people do research. So the, the comprehensive nature of data sets is a genomic feature, but it's the qualitative change of research using that data, which is the true contribution of genomic technology. Janet. Uh, Janet Rowley, University of Chicago. The success of the Human Genome Project was dependent in large measure on the development of centers that focused on, on DNA sequencing and did it obviously extraordinarily well. It seems to me that in the future we are going to be developing technologies that are going to be equally demanding, equally expensive. And I think that not only NHGRI, but all of NIH should think about how they could develop uh, such centers of uh, very specialized uh, equipment and uh, uh, expertise that could be used by the scientific community in a sense analogous to the advanced photon source, which is presently at uh, Argonne uh, National Labs. And whether this is a place where NIH and the Department of Energy should be considering joint projects that involve large and expensive technologies for the, uh, to help the research community, I think is, is something that we should begin to consider. Okay, I'm, we can certainly start entertaining uh, any comments about the second floor as we line up. But. <laughs> Kurt? Oh, this is more general. Uh, Kurt Fishbeck, NINDS. Uh, back to what the points that were made by the first two uh, questions. Uh, I think, you know, with any building, it's good to have some kind of a timeline. And, uh, or, and I, I recognize that it's hard to have quantitative, uh, well-defined goals like we've had for the, in the past, but at least to have some kind of a framework. Is this going to be like an Amish uh, barn raising, or is it going to be more like the pyramid? Uh, to know, <laughs> to know which, which components are going to be, or need to be in place first, and, th and then what maybe is an appendix to the thing, uh, like tacked onto an R01. Uh, what, you know, what's, what's going to happen first, and, and what do you want to have accomplished within five years, and which, which are the longer term goals? David. Uh, I'm still on the first floor. I haven't found the elevator yet. Um, to Introduce pick up yourself. On David Bentley from the Sanger Institute. Um, just to pick up on Janet's and perhaps answer Ewan's uh, questions, one of the things from the, the morning discussion, I think, is, is yes, and the, and the initial paper focused on a lot of technology development as being a strength, and it's a recognized strength behind the success of the HGP. Um, and if we follow that route, continue to follow that route, uh, what we're missing perhaps is the idea that this is being converted to a discipline, which I think was, is perhaps a central goal which NHGRI and nobody else can and should grasp to develop a discipline, recognizing perhaps that's the true challenge. It's an uncertain area we're moving into, 
Um, and the discipline, perhaps, is part of that. It's defining how to approach the uncertainty, how to define rules, guidelines within it to tackle it head on. It's a much bigger challenge, in a sense, than a well-defined, simple genome sequence. And I would imagine that that sort of notion will probably go on the preamble. Yeah. And it was on, the, and I think that would be certainly detailed there. Uh, I have some advice and a question. Introduction. Ed Tom Pollard uh, from Yale. Uh, Eric, uh, three people have already said this, so I'm going to say it again. The, the uh, description of the goals is not uh, working. Uh, they're not crisp enough. They're not deliverable enough. They're too vague. And they were better yesterday afternoon. Uh, they were better yesterday afternoon in the sense that the first goal was to complete the parts list. Second was to uh, identify where each of the parts was expressed in the human body. The third one was to identify the partners for all the parts. You know, it, it was the, the I, no, 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 but the way you've described it, the comprehend, you know, it just. They, they wanted to explain it out yeah. in the branches and the challenges below it. Yeah, okay, so well, that was my advice. Make, make it crisper and, and more deliverable like the Genome Institute has always done. Now, my question has to do with what is chemical genomics. Uh, how in the hell did that sneak in there? Because I don't know what, what that's all about. Uh, this, this was uh, strongly felt by many, including in the broad discussion last night, that having tools to modulate, generic tools to modulate, not developing the inhibitor to your favorite kinase, but being able to put in the hands of investigators RNAIs that would be able to interfere with genes systematically. And I think it's felt that in the time frame being contemplated, five to ten years, having comprehensive RNAI libraries that have been validated is extremely important. And similarly, having the access to screening of diverse small molecule libraries to be able to um, screen phenotypically and be able to identify targets in a facile fashion was something that had to exist not merely in the pharmaceutical industry for the development of pharmaceutical leads, but as research reagents available to any cell biologist. And that being able to create those technologies was crucial to ever figuring out what function would be. So both of those are, you know, core technologies here. Well, for what it's worth, RDI sounds like a good genomic, genome institute project and the chemical thing doesn't. No, that, and that's a good opinion, but I think there, there's a certain sense by many others, at least that was expressed, that over the course of the next 10 years, small molecules would end up highly complementary to RNAIs and that they would be as well distributed and facile. It may prove false, but that certainly was, was a goal, and I, I don't think I would at this point give up on that. But the goal is to modulate, and if the right, and that, that's why it was phrased as these scientific goals, which I don't think are very different. If it's to modulate, and the best way to modulate at a genome-wide level proves to be just RNAi, and chemistry turns out to not to be fruitful, then you stick to that as the way to modulate. If chemistry turns out to be a fruitful way to do it, then we should do it by chemistry. So the focus is on the ability to perturb comp components in a genome-wide way, and it will be up to the planners each year to figure out how best to invest to do that. So I have a comment about the over David Altshuler from Mass General and Whitehead Genome Center. I have a comment about the overall architecture, if you will, of the building, which is that I think that the first floor clearly has the, poten has the potential to be very deliverable and quantifiable. I think that many people have commented already that their level of enthusiasm would depend, I guess, on the specifics, having the, those specifics which were there, and I guess people want to see them and approve them. But let's assume that I think that could be done. The second and third floors, which conveys at least, and I'm partially dealing with the message that's sent, seems like about two-thirds of the mission. And I find it increasingly harder to see how you would reach that level of specificity for the second floor and the third floor. And while I'm not suggesting that means the aspiration shouldn't be there, I guess it seems to me that a, I, I think it would actually be pretty impressive if the first floor was accomplished in the next five years, that there was a complete toolkit with all these different uh, levels. I understand. I understand. I, I understand it's not a five-year plan, but in the absence, I'm just expressing an opinion, in the absence of, you know, saying identify the genetic basis of common disease and understand pathways that are disordered is something obviously that many of us are very interested and excited to do, but it's just increasingly unclear how these goals or how you'd measure success, and I think that's at least 
a level of, you know, at least the first part, we can see how after additional debate, those quantifications, those specificities could be added to the first floor. The, la the, more, the greater difficulty doing that with the current go goals in the second, third floor is a source of uh, certainty is it should really be two-thirds of the whole, at least visual picture and sense of what the aspiration of the group is. Yeah, I have. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, two things. One is uh, I think it's really important for all of Eric's goals that there be something written down there about what at least the current means are. And while this is, not, uh, and uh, I, I just wanted to be have an explicit statement. My understanding was that under comprehensive blah, 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 there was going to be a list of things that are on the docket to do with some kind of timeline associated with each of them, right? That, uh, that's what we should understand. You just didn't make the slide, okay? Am I correct? We were told not to. Uh, whatever, whatever, for whatever reason, okay? That's what's got to be under Right, okay. Uh, uh, that's important. The second thing is I think that uh, we have a danger of jargon here, which I would like uh, to, again, get a clarification. Uh, from my uh, uh, experience in the discussion, comprehensive really means genome-wide or could be scaled to genome-wide. Okay, which is much clearer uh, to some of us than comprehensive, which could mean almost anything. Okay, uh, we suggested comprehensive for the preamble, but I, I would like to uh, lobby for the uh, rest uh, restoration of the operational definition that has served the genome uh, uh, extremely well for defining what what is uh, our business and what uh, primarily and what is somebody else's, namely. If a proposal comes in, whether it be from an R01 or some huge centroid, okay, uh, it, um, it, uh, the, the test is, is it going to give you genome-wide information or can it be scaled to genome-wide information? If the answer is yes, we talk about it. If the answer is no, we send it somewhere else. Good. So if we took out... Including chemistry. Yes, if we yeah, took okay. out, you're right, so that distinguishes between the chemistry of a molecule and of a whole thing. If we took out comprehensive and replaced it by genome-wide with a yeah. little asterisk that said, or could be scaled to genome-wide, you'd be happy? Yes, I would, uh, that I'd was my suggestion. That would be that fine. Would be my suggestion. Comprehensive is there because it fits so nicely right. with comprehensive. Now, this is in the spirit thing. of clarification because I Agreed. believe that that was the consensus. That was the goal of the committee. Uh, and uh, so there was no, uh, you know, I, at least in the sessions that I sat, everybody was comfortable with that. Maybe because they all come from the genome community, but anyway. Okay. All right. Last last point is: Do you think you could find a more elegant word than warehousing? <laughs> I don't know what that was. Oh, data warehousing. Yeah. Do you have an offer of a word? Well, uh, just uh, reformulate. I just the the idea that what we do when we uh, disseminate data is uh, run a warehouse, yeah, just grit, grits the wrong... Warehouse is the first part where you store it. Dissemination is there. So you just want to they, complain about the word warehouse. I, I, <laughs> yes, uh, I, I rely yeah, upon your, your thesaurus. Is, uh, I, I will think on uh, alternative... Storage. But storage is, is, is better than warehousing. But I think the idea, the idea of having... A, 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 Databases and archives, which are not the same thing, uh, that uh, that are accessible to various uh, kinds of communities, is a really important thing that isn't captured by warehouse. No, no. All right, and the other way, anybody, we can we can now move up to the roof if you want to come by the microphones. It's after Art. It's anywhere you want to go. Uh, at Baylor Houston. Um, I want to uh, approach the second floor and try to suggest maybe a format for some deliverables that one could do, um, which would be a lot along the line of how the, the sequencing itself has been handled. One could say, okay, there's some number of genotypes per individual that would be useful to have in, in, in the ideal world based something along the half map kind of data and say, we will do that number of genotypes on some number of individuals on some number of disorders that we think are priority because we don't currently understand their pathogenesis and based on their abundance. And we will take things like the NIMH collection of schizophrenia samples and we will dump all of the data, all of the genotype data into an open database every night. And so we we'll say we'll do, you know, 100,000 genotypes on 
100 individuals with these disorders, and I, I think it would be painful and create a lot of antagonism and difficulty at least, but you make this list of disorders like we currently, you know, play off mouse versus Drosophila versus C. elegans. I mean, you want to play off asthma versus schizophrenia versus whatever, but I think one could make a deliverable at the second uh, floor kind of level. Uh, the only thing I, I think we might not know if those genotypes are really the information that's going to solve the problem. For instance, I think we might want to add epigenotypes about the status of CPG methylation around the genome and so on. But I think one could construct a, a, a deliverable that says, this is the minimum. We think we'll be able to go beyond our promise, but we're quite sure we could do this many genotypes on this many individuals from this number of diseases. Maybe you don't have to specify the diseases now, but say it'll be at least 10 or 20 or something like that. With the goal of making this more quantitative. Yes, but well, with all, and also with the goal of these patients give their samples to be in the the NIMH autism or schizophrenia collection, or whatever, to get progress. I think if you took all those people, all those samples, and dumped all the genotypes in the computer every night, it would change the, ar the architecture of how the research is done, but it would vastly speed it up. And you could have a few very high throughput centers dumping the data in, and everybody can be mining it uh, at their will. Any, any of the managers of the second floor want to make a comment on this? Well, I certainly am not opposed to specificity. Um, I, I suppose that one of the reasons that we talked about strategic targeting and identifying um, paradigms and pilot projects was that we wanted to not constrain the leadership of NHGRI in terms of figuring out what would be the ideal, um, the ideal projects to pursue. But I certainly think that what you have in mind, Art, is exactly what we have in mind, that, 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 that what we would really like to see happening here, and maybe Rick can say something too about this, is that what we would really like to see happening here is for a, for a process by which it's possible to identify which would be optimal projects to go after and then to go after them specifically um, to do this kind of work. I'm not at all opposed to what you're saying, Art. I just didn't want to tell Francis which diseases and exactly how to do it. Yeah, I think that's a, a, an important point. The other point is that it's not clear that what's available in any of the repositories today is the type of study and, and sample repository that you would actually want to use. The uh, HAP map is being devised uh, which will, for a project that really hasn't been formulated in terms of what will be necessary from a patient <coughs> recruitment uh, uh, perspective. I mean, I don't think there is any cohort out there that uh, would be large enough to be used by HapMap uh, at this point if we said we needed 300,000 uh, uh, genotypes. Uh, very few studies out there would survive uh, uh, a correction for uh, power. Uh, and, but I think it critically underscores that we really need to be thinking about cohorts and we really need to be partnering across NIH. I think it's much easier to see how we need to proceed from a societal and NIH perspective than it is from within the walls of NHGRI. And I think that's really one of the challenges going forward, is how to make sure that the fruits of all of this actually get broadly used across NIH. Why don't we try to stay on this topic, because I see various people have jumped I, up specifically. So Art, I just respond? I, I think that the individual institutes, in fact, have invested inordinate, uh, very large grants in making collections of appropriate types. And it, yesterday morning when we were talking, I asked Alan Roses about how many samples would it take to find APOE by this strategy, the APOE-Alzheimer relationship? And he said, well, if you just look at 30 controls and 30 uh, Alzheimer's, you'd see the effect. I mean, I think for 30 and 30, uh, if you can pick up, maybe it's 100 and 100 and 500 and 500, but I think it is not a very large number. Kurt, did you want That's, to talk on this? Yeah. Or? Okay. Well, I, I was just going to say, in, in answer to Art's request for a quantifiable goal for the second floor, uh, uh, we, I, I think you could have something for s simple uh, single gene disorders. If, as we heard, uh, only 10 percent of the OMIM uh, diseases uh, have uh, identified genes or, or linkage, uh, we could set a goal that in five years we'll double that. Uh, uh, you know, I think there are quantifiable goals that are realistic and attainable with regard to single gene disorders that may be a little uh, easier to define than for the complex trait. Neil, I'm assuming you want to yeah, comment on this? Uh, right, Neil Risch from Stanford. <clears throat> I'm getting the feeling some of the problem here is that there was deliberate vagueness in this document. 
<clears throat> perhaps because there wasn't complete consistency of what people were saying, and so there's some, that's why there was like maybe a lack of commitment to make very specific statements. Um, so this is, I guess, the devil's in the details. And uh, one question I had, for example, was, um, <clears throat> we're changing ge uh, comprehensive to, to genome-wide now, but still the, the comprehensive description of heritable va variation population. There was a lot of nuance in that statement. First of all, the, the definition of population. What is the definition of population? How many populations? Which populations? This is very important. Second of all, is there going to be an equal effort coding and non-coding regions? Is it going to be equal depth in coding and non-coding regions? Because there's a lot of disagreement potentially in that area of how much effort. And again, if there's a fixed budget, then there's a question of how much effort to allocate to different, to different projects. And uh, so that's what I'm saying. I think this is, this is the issue I'm particularly interested in, but I think there was vagueness perhaps. I don't know. You're going to have to say. But because there was not consistency of opinion about exactly what routes to take. Right. No, I, I think you raise a really important point, and I think there was a deliberate choice not to decide those issues in this document, but instead to let them contend, and that if, in fact, as time goes on, coding variation is the best thing to invest in because the return is high, or we've saturated on, coding and th on, on the return from coding, or we've saturated on the results of looking at 40 populations. So I think this notion of genome-wide or comprehensive had a sense of having squeezed the valuable information out, having saturated. And we've just got to monitor that over time. I think it would be a mistake for us to figure, to think that we could pre-decide those questions. So it is to get a comprehensive picture of variation. The best way to do that, you know, that, that will be grant study sections continuing meetings of things. I was going to say that genome has actually a long history of setting goals without specifying mechanisms of getting there. I mean, when I think back to the discussions about how we were going to do sequencing, I think it would have been a dreadful mistake 10 years ago to say we're going to do it by this methodology as opposed to other methodologies. And moreover, genome has a long history of taking advantage of opportunities as they arise to make new insights. From the ELSI <coughs> side, we have done a lot of work with CF carrier testing with uh, predictive test, predisposition testing for cancer, and now for hemochromatosis. Those could not have been specified ex ante, but when they came up and, and developed good models to explore um, cross-cutting issues, um, they were exploited. I think it would be a dreadful mistake for us to say here that the right model system is asthma or deafness or whatever. I think that that requires more work as we figure out what the methodologies are, but uh, it would, I think it would be hubris and also narrowing our vision too much to say um, exactly what the methodology is and exactly what the right um, model project is, because we don't know that yet. Uh, this is a question about the root. Is yeah, it? introduce yourself. I'm Roger Brent uh, from the Molecular Sciences Institute. Uh, this is about the root, and it may be obvious. Uh, I, uh, buy, I, I, I buy the distinction, I like it, between uh, foundational research and policy-related research. I'm uh, at least a little bit concerned about the use of the word research in this context and the connotations that that has. Uh, if uh, Margaret Mead visits American Samoa and wants to investigate uh, issues involving uh, adolescent girlhood that might be universal to human cultures, sure, she does research. She's taught by her professors how to run around with a notebook. It's research. If, if Alexis de Tocqueville visits the young American Republic and runs around and observes things and says, sees policy issues confronting the young republic, um, he's just running around and then he writes a book. He thinks about things. Um, research may connote uh, too much in this context, questionnaires and things that could be practiced in academic medical centers. I suggest that you might consider broadening it to say research and scholarship. And the thing about scholarship as compared to research is that it's really cheap. You get a tremendous bang for the buck. <laughs> you can get a scholar going for a year, and it costs nothing by NIH terms. And if the person writes an influential book, you won. Uh. I'll just respond um, that I think we have a definitional issue here. Uh, I, would not, <laughs> I would not limit research to impaired data collection. Uh, I have no problem personally with using the terms uh, research and scholarship, but, but I would um, r really make a strong point that research can include uh, activities other than empiric data collection. That, that would be my view. I'd, I'd welcome others' comments. 
Yeah, uh, Aziz Sachadina from uh, University of Virginia. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, raise a question about the roof again, and I think uh, I find a conspicuous absence of resources in LC and policy, as if there are no resources or they are not important enough. But I think our public success of the project depends upon listening to the different communities. We are a multi-faith and multicultural community. Our society is rich in plurality, and we need to somehow uh, identify the resources that are necessary. We are somehow surrogating the entire work to secular bioethicists, or ethicists perhaps who are secular in their training. Uh, thinking that that secular ethics will have a universal appeal and will be able to resolve the questions for the entire public uh, in all its uh, variations and differences. Quite to the contrary, I think the acceptance of the project and the fear that is today, today dominant in the public can be removed by these resources that we can identify in different communities in the country at the moment and around the world because we need to communicate these ideas uh, at the level whereby it is acceptable to the religious sensibilities of the people. After all, disease and health has a lot to do with religion, has a lot to do with cultural understandings of these, and if we do not identify the resources, I think we'll not be able to reach out. The, the, I think the roof uh, metaphor is important to keep in mind that it really provides with what I call the cover for the entire project. Otherwise, it is exposed to all kinds of uh, criticism from the public. I appreciate the comment very much. Um, we debated whether we should make an explicit uh, point of inclusion of points of view, of wide varieties of points of view, uh, and, and maybe we should have made that more explicit in our slides. It was certainly a, uh, implicit in our thinking. Uh, we actually <laughs> felt that was a completely cross-cutting issue. That is, at each floor, the inclusion of diverse communities in the efforts was extremely important the inclusion of diverse points of view uh, in discussions um, uh, of um, discussions in the small groups. I, I think there was a lot of endorsement of the need to incorporate different world views, and I would not say any intention to limit things to a narrow secular bioethics perspective, but to be inclusive. Again, other comments, welcome. Yeah, uh, Jeff Duick, uh, South San Francisco. So two comments. One is really about the, the roof. I mean, it, there's a tremendous framework there to think about how this new science will impact the interfaces between science and society, as well as the impact on society itself. But it, it, it fails to look inside to see that one of the biggest changes the last 10 years is the fundamental change inside the scientific enterprise. So I think we really need to consider how do we educate people for the future? How do we enable them? It's the intellectual capital question. How do we enable them to have a career in a scientific establishment that is increasingly dependent upon cross-disciplinary research in interaction, which looks very different from traditional academic departments, and, and, how do, and, how do we, and how do we set up the operational organizational modalities to do that? Furthermore, given the size and scales of these operations, we gotta really think about our funding mechanisms, both from the point of view, how do we give people the flexibility to react to change, uncoupling from the normal grant cycles, in an era where technology platforms flip every three years, you know, technology is both indispensable and disposable. How do we deal with that? So there's no discussion of the inside. There's a lot of discussion of the outside. And I think fundamentally that's going to be, be one of the biggest issues if we want to maintain this. So that's, that's probably the bigger comment. The other one has to do with the, probably the first foundation in, in, the, in the chemical libraries. So this is really a comment if you buy a car, you better put gas in it. And my point is going to be is it's too limiting to say chemical libraries. I mean, what we're really talking about is generating tool compounds. So we don't want to limit it just to small molecules. We want to think about aptamers and antibodies and things like that. But it's pretty naive to think you're gonna actually get something that's useful from simply screening a library. That's like thinking you're gonna make an antibody by just buying rabbits in a few cages. So I think if you're gonna do the uh, enterprise, that you not only you have to include access to this diversity, whether it's small molecules or aptamers or large molecules, but you need chemistry resources, molecular pharmacology, all these other little things. So make sure that it, we don't basically get what we wish for and what we, what we get we can't use. Uh, Joe McInerney from Nitchpeg in Baltimore. Uh, I want to pick up on a comment about the outside. I was struck in the discussion of the roof that the education seemed to focus on what were defined as the foundational and policy issues. I hope that does not imply that the, uh, the genome program will back off from a commitment to education about the science itself. 
which is an extremely important piece of what we have to do to build the roof unless we educate the public and a broad variety of other individuals about the underlying science the discussions and and formulation of policy is going to be scientifically bereft what and there was no intention to back away from that you know I think I think if there was any uncertainty was actually which floor to emphasize that point I mean you could see that Ellen had that in her floor but I don't disagree and I actually think that's a cross-cutting issue that's an educational mission shared by all three floors so David Van Tegen I want to pick up on a cease and why his previous discussion on consulting with the wider issues of other communities and other beliefs and so on I I think clearly we've moved towards an area of consultation in order to obtain a collaboration in order to develop resources or whatever community engagement for samples in far countries is a good example of that I feel we could take it further internationally as well this is not just an NHGRI comment but it is potentially genomics is a good platform to do it to actually in advance to to really engage communities and consult and 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 learn more about the relevant relevant needs of each other without actually demanding something in return straight away so not as needed but to develop it as part of the discipline and I think genomics and genetics and knowledge of self is actually one of the best platforms with which to discuss with remote communities with very different beliefs and perhaps NHGRI could consider that Tim Lashen with the NHGRI well I just had a point of clarification you talked about research in the LC context and research in the policy context but the NHGRI has also done well we're not a policy-making body we sort of help to influence policy and I was wondering how that sort of realm would factor in your in your plan yeah I I'd actually like to defer to to people from NHGRI on that my understanding is that I'll just I'll just to communicate my understanding that 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 there may be a very important role for promoting certain policy positions that the government has taken and NHGRI may have a very important role in that but in terms of an ongoing plan for what NHGRI should should in a perpetuating way be doing in terms of policy we saw the focus on policy options development of policy options I don't know I'd like to respond to that I think all of us who have done this work for the last five years have found the clinical environment increasingly difficult and NHGRI I think needs to be playing a more proactive role in the future to ensure that all of the tools that we've been developing for the last 12 years don't become useless because of unassailable obstacles to actually doing the studies that we created this foundation to do that's a statement about something we seem to have spent quite a lot of time on the foundation which is of course fundamental that's why it's called a foundation and then we've jumped up to the third floor and we've skipped over the second floor which was just my experience yesterday and I partly came here for the second floor and I think I just you know want to make a simple statement that the public out there which people talk about all the time is deeply invested in this component of genomics and I kept even hearing that this isn't genomics yesterday I think that there's going to be a huge credibility problem if the Genome Institute doesn't work really hard on figuring out ways to take the enormous richness of genomics and translate it up to understanding disease and that's really all I wanted to say that doesn't even matter which diseases single genes are probably a good place to begin but diseases in general have to be addressed over the next five years and what I say over and over is is it isn't going to be five years this is it's going to be 10 years 20 years even 50 years over that time period it probably will happen and it absolutely must happen let me endorse your sentiment I think the public supports this project in part because they really do believe there are going to be major deliverables here and 
and I approach this from the perspective of a general pediatrician who's going to be um, using these technologies. Um, I do think that, in a, and I do think that this plan in, does endorse the use of these technologies to really move forward in developing deliverables that are going to be uh, accessible not only um, in the research setting but also in the clinical setting. I think it's going to be really tough, and we were trying to talk about that, and I think that that I think that this is an area where genome needs to be very strategic about picking um, picking uh, problems that are really going to advance our understanding in these areas and really set up models that others can possibly use to explore, explore other areas. But I would not even back away from a, for a second from saying that at the end of the day, this is about primarily about making people, giving people the opportunity to be healthy. I mean, that's why we're doing this, I think. So certainly why I'm doing it. Uh, David Barker from Illumina. I'd like to second that, uh, too. And, and also uh, my comment is that it seems to me there's a difference in specificity between the goals of the first and second floors and of the third floor. I'm just wondering if that was intentional. On the first floor, and I'm paraphrasing now, first floor we have a, a comprehensive and comprehensible description of the parts list. And on the second floor we have identify all genes and pathways that contribute to better, uh, to health and disease, et cetera. And on the third floor, we have identify and address the pressing societal implications of genomics instead of the pressing and societal implications of genomics are what is the uh, new impact on the concept of race and ethnicity, the concept of what is normal, the, uh, the uh, impact on culture, family, and self the change in education that must result from doing big biology, you know, things like this. I'm just wondering if that's a difference in specificity that was intentional. I don't think, I mean, my impression is that all we're dealing with is, is cartoons that can be put up in a quick 10 minutes and spoken about. I think there's going to be a similar level of specificity in the ultimate document. Is that a fair? Okay. Yes. Uh, I would like to uh, come back to the metaphor that we, we have. Identify yourself. I'm John Miller from Northwestern uh, University Medical School. Um, it looks like to me that, that uh, the, the new architecture is, is sort of a modest country cottage. And I'm afraid that the, uh, the, the third floor is really the attic. Um, it, it strikes me as that since the, the, the walls go in and uh, it, it seems to have uh, a certain characteristic to it. Um, what I'd like to do is suggest is there are other kinds of architectural metaphors that may work very well also. Uh, I happen to, to currently live in a 30-story glass tower, which also is a house. Um, and one of the things you could do is, is to see some of these as floors. And in fact, what we might do is be creative and, and see the public education side as glass walls. Uh, because what we need to do, as I think Joe was saying earlier, is we need to have the public looking in all three floors. Um, and, and we can be creative about doors and walls in a way to explain what we want to do that doesn't limit us to sticking uh, social implications in the attic. And I'm a little afraid that the, uh, the, the current metaphor uh, puts uh, uh, social concerns uh, away from the main part of the house. W would penthouse suite feel better for you? <laughs> well, uh, a nice big hot tub, wet bar, roof garden. I, roof garden. Yes, I think when it comes to to appropriations and fighting stem cell battles, you you need to hold high ground. So uh, somewhere up there, uh, I would I would think that uh, public understanding should be. Uh, may be seen as walls as opposed to penthouses. Hi, I'm Wendy Ullman from the University of Michigan, and I actually also want to address the metaphor. I actually like the house idea, um, because after all, houses can be renovated and you can build additions. So I think this could actually serve us quite well in the long term. And I just wanted to, to convey the point that I actually think that education and workforce should actually be the electricity and the lighting in the house, because if you don't have the workforce that's genetically educated to be able to provide the services, or if you don't have education of the public and healthcare professionals, we're never going to see the furniture and we're never going to see the appliances and all the tools that are being created uh, by the Human Genome Project. So. I do have to point out the, the three G's worked very hard to get cross-cutting demographics in the attendees for this meeting. We forgot to invite an architect. So, <laughs> we let you down. So I, I'd like to um, return to the con concept of uh, the proper level of specificity Neil said, and I think he's right, the devil's in the details and making sure that we capture enough specificity. And when, when we said earlier, and this has come up throughout the two days, 
uh, you know, five-year plan, and the answer is, oh, it's not a five-year plan, it's a vision statement or something like that. And I guess I would challenge at the risk of annoying the people at the front of the room why that's a, why that's a good decision. Because it seems to me that, um, no, yeah, I'm not done yet, Eric. Um, <laughs> the, um, yeah, that's fine. No, because I think that the, the danger of a vision state, it's not that we shouldn't have vision statements, the preamble, or there might be places for vision, but I think that, the commu that what I've heard over and over again in the last two days is the desire for tangible goals. And you can't predict beyond the next few years. So clearly if you go, in other words, in a sense, if you take a vision beyond five years, well, and clearly you can't specify what you do. But if you were to specify the next five years, you can actually say things. I can example, for, and I'll give something concrete for floor two. We might not be able to find, we're not going to find the next five years all the genes for common disease. No one suggests that. But there are a lot of pointed questions in the community about, you know, and again, Neil raised one. It's a good question. You know, how much we look in coding regions versus haplotype approaches. I could imagine if you want to find the disease genes, what's the utility of founder populations, admixture mapping, drift mapping, cosmopolitan populations, family-based, not, you could have a program that would actually, and I'm sure that's included in what's considered, where you wouldn't be doing what every other institute's gonna do, because probably other institutes are not gonna have programs to try and explore the power, utility, et cetera. If you go beyond five years, you're probably gonna figure all that out so you don't need it. I'm not sure why you wouldn't wanna specify those things. All right, Eric, you can talk now. I, I think it's a question of what this document is the proper analog to. I don't think this is the analog to the last five-year plan and the last five-year plan. Nope. I think this is the analog roughly to the Alberts report. The Alberts report was not a five-year plan. The Alberts report was a 15-year plan. It's not a vision. There's nothing vision about it. This has to have deliverable items. But the five-year time horizon, I think, is not the appropriate time horizon for us to lay out here. Now, once a 15-year time horizon was laid out, maybe Francis thinks this should be 10 or 12, but longer than five, once that is laid out, there is every reason to sit down and say, now what are we doing in the next five years? In post-Alberts Committee report, there was, we're going to really focus on genetic maps. We're going to try to figure out how to do physical maps, and we're not going to do a whole lot of sequencing right now because we don't know how to do it, so we'll develop on technologies. So it did reduce to exactly what you're saying, but I think we should seize the opportunity now to lay a longer than five-year plan out and then fill in specifics. So I think that's fine, just, just to finish, I think that's fine and probably a need for it. But I just hear over and over and over again in every discussion I've been a part of the desire for the tangibility that can't be there if you go beyond five years because we obviously don't know what we need to do beyond those. So some way to bring that right. back in. Yeah, and a lot of the discussion last night was, of course, in reaction to a feeling that what was there was such tangibility without the clear sense of where we were going. I don't think there's any problem with melding those two. I think this is a framework into which now to put the, the tangibles for the next five years. Yeah. Janet. Uh, Janet Rowley. I'd, I'd like to pick up on Bob Lifton's, uh, uh, Richard uh, Lifton's comment because many things that we talk about using large cohorts, etc., will be absolutely impossible with some of the rules that are presently in place for the use of material from human subjects. And if we don't understand that now, and if we don't begin to work with other agencies, mainly government agencies, that are establishing these rules and continually making them more restrictive, we'll have great, uh, pro uh, great opportunities, we'll have the tools and the samples, we won't be able to use them. And I speak also from the standpoint of somebody who's interested in particularly leukemia but cancer. The, uh, inability often to connect the genomic uh, changes in patient samples with the response of that patient to treatment and the outcome is a tragedy and it's enforced by these rulemaking organizations and we have to deal with that up front or you're having 300,000 samples isn't going to do you any good because you can't use a single one for the research you want to do. I have a question about a wording on the third um, floor. Uh, you, your first uh, goal is to explore the impact of genomics on X, Y, and Z. Do you really mean genomics, which I view as a way of doing business, as opposed to genotype or genes or something else? Yeah, I, I think we could phrase it as impact of genomic research or maybe genomic information, uh, but, but I, I wouldn't limit it 
uh, genotype might be a, a broad enough term, but, but I think it's the impact of genomic research. Yeah. Paul? Paul Miller, I'm a commissioner of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Just, just a comment, um, on, uh, I'm back on the third floor. Um, one community, when we all talk about um, sort of communities that we need to reach out to, um, usually race and sort of generically uh, disadvantaged uh, folks, one community that I think is really critical that never gets mentioned but I think is always in the room and in fact I don't think has ever was mentioned in the original draft of the document are disabled people, um, people with disabilities and I think that you really have to tease that out and specifically deal with the disability community on ELSI issues because um, th this revolution impacts disabled people greatly and, um, and if you don't bring the disability community along um, it's going to be harder to move the revolution um, forward and there is tremendous concern and fear based upon a backdrop of eugenics and all sorts of uh, identity issues and I think that there's a lot there in these ELSI issues that we need to think about so I would really encourage you just that the community is going to be looking for themselves in any document you do and if they are not explicitly mentioned they will feel um, particularly excluded and that will ultimately be a problem. Scott Ramsey from the Fred Hutchinson. A couple of suggestions just to throw out. Uh, the, the first relates to the second pillar, the genomics to health, or it's not a pillar now, is it? It's a floor. Um, genomics to health. Um, I think one of the things that to make this real and concrete, we need to have um, highly targeted translational projects that the Genome Project can identify and hold out, preferably with a snappy acronym, somewhat like the SPORE programs uh, that NCI has where, you, where they're targeted for rapid translation from, you know, biology to the bedside. Um, so I would, I would think about formulating uh, highly targeted programs like that to make the second pillar really concrete. Um, the second uh, suggestion sort of relates to uh, the clarity issue, and I, and I think I underestimated the importance of this this process before I came here, and I also underestimated the breadth of the audience that I think is ultimately going to be reading this document. So my slightly tongue-in-cheek uh, plea is, before this gets committed to print, call your mother. <laughs> now if your mother is a molecular biologist, you have to call your sister. <laughs> but try to explain this to someone who isn't in this room or someone who doesn't have this level of sophistication. I think to the degree that they can understand that it will be, or not understand that it will be telling uh, and important as you think about shaping this document. Okay. Uh, seeing no one else queued up at the mic, I think now is the time for several announcements and then we're going to take a break. Uh, first announcement I've been asked to make is that in the back of the room on the tables are some copies of advertisements that are going out. The NHGRI uh, uh, program office is, uh, extramural office is doing a recruitment for program staff in several areas, LC research, uh, genetic variation and translational uh, research and uh, anybody grab those if you know of people who might be suitable to apply for that. Second announcement is that uh, checkout is at 1130 so if you have not checked out you might want to quickly go check out because uh, there is another group coming in and they need our rooms and all the usual drill so 1130 you need to check out by Third announcement is we will break now for, for coffee, et cetera. We will reconvene sharply at 10.15. Um, and uh, we're doing fine on time, but let's please reconvene for the next series of, uh, of talks. Thank you. Excellent. So as many of you know and participated in last evening, we convened uh, six uh, special topics working groups to uh, discuss uh, uh, an array of different topics. And so we're going to now hear very brief uh, summaries from each of these, uh, from leaders of each of these groups. I'm, we're asking that each of these uh, group leaders please spend no more than five minutes summarizing. We will have five minutes of discussion and we'll keep moving because we've got six of them to get through and we still have some additional talks. So the first one, um, is Barbara Wald, who will be talking about a special topic entitled NHGRI role relative to others.
Uh, this isn't going to clip. Oh, I'm on top. Okay. Uh, so this will indeed be. He can do it. Uh, this will indeed be brief. The topic that our breakout group addressed uh, is something that we'd all been talking about all day. So in some sense, uh, this is a summary minus many of the things that were already talked about or addressed in, um, in reversioning the plan uh, this morning. Uh, the first thing that we recognized in thinking about the relationship of NHGRI's commitments in genomics and its interest in genomics as stated in the plan relative to other institutes within NIH. And uh, I think uh, we all felt it's time to acknowledge uh, that this is a good thing. There are fuzzy boundaries between the institutes uh, in terms of their interest in genomics, and that's part of the maturation of NI, uh, NHGRI from Genome Project to Genome Institute. Uh, fuzzy boundaries are part of the NIH in general. Um, and so uh, here are the fuzzy boundaries, and of course not all the institutes are here. If you happen to send a representative to our panel, you're more likely to have your uh, circle up here. <laughs> and you can see NHGRI is placed in the way that we would all want it, dead center. But you can also see that in, it's, it's almost getting squished out. And so obviously the tension here is for NHGRI to have those central things that we're listing as our main goals and our main mission. Uh, that probably are things that other institutes would cheer for and like to see the output from, but that they would not be so likely to pursue. Um, on the other hand, uh, particularly with time, there's going to be a shift in the application of comprehensive and global kinds of technologies that may be generated first at NHGRI and come to be applied all over the NIH in the interests of various um, uh, disease systems, body parts, and, and other appropriate entities. Um, it's obvious that for scientific reasons as well as budgetary reasons and cultural reasons, we should simply say in this report that that is the case and that it's a good thing. Um, uh, which may seem too much like what uh, David Botstein calls applehood, uh, which is mom and apple pie and all of that. Uh, but there are places for applehood, and I think this might be one of them. Uh, there was the explicit suggestion that with respect to this plan as we write it, that uh, NHGRI staff, which of course has infinite time, uh, should indeed do a little work on the ground between now and the time of the writing to really talk about some of the things that are off in the list of things that had, uh, I believe, pound signs on them in our world of asterisks and tildes and other kinds of things. Uh, those things that are good partnering things and good sharing things. And the suggestion comes from other institutes, gee, why don't we chat a little bit about which ones to highlight on the list before the fact? And uh, that seems like a good idea. And to explicitly acknowledge the interests of other institutes in missions that they've already identified that are genomic. Of course, the problem is that the report's not going to be infinitely long. We're encouraging it to be shorter. An explicit statement, uh, as in other areas, risks um, uh, failure to be utterly inclusive. So that's uh, a hot rock that we're happy to toss to NHGRI staff and uh, let you deal with. Um, this is very short, just a few more points. It's clear that over time uh, the activities that belong initially at NHGRI are going to move out and become shared or even no longer belong at NHGRI. We all can think of things that are evolving already in that direction, the sequencing of many pathogen genomes, for example. And that's exactly how things should be. Um, we do foresee the ongoing mission, uh, which we have discussed uh, at length and in other ways, for conceiving and launching global projects uh, at NHGRI. And so it's just kind of an endless conveyor belt of new global uh, projects that come out of NHGRI, some as demonstration projects, some as the whole enchilada to deliver data that other people work from. Um, then we get. Particularly, we discussed the uh, issues that were part of the old Pillar 3, but that have to do with ELSI. And just to put a punctuation point, if, if one could be more needed uh, after uh, Dr. Raleigh's passionate comments, there's 
the need uh, and urgent need for timely address of certain of these issues, especially as regards human samples and connection to uh, clinical covariate information and outcomes. And this just has to be dealt with or uh, our floor two is going nowhere. And, and that would be so tragic. And I think this document, uh, and I'm reflecting what I believe the group, uh, the general sense of the group, that this document has to be very bold in saying that. And it's also just a mission for NHGRI in all the other venues I'm sure it's being lobbied for, but to try and get some real energy behind this. Um, now, this may be a bit more uh, controversial because obviously at some point we come down to trying to parse how do we distribute budgets that are not infinite. And in the way of our interactions with society in general and explicitly those things that are propelled by the Genome ELSI program, the question is how to parse all of these good things that reach out very far and include how we relate to society in many ways having to do with anything genetic against a non-infinite budget. And so there is at least some sentiment, though I think there may not be consensus, that a real effort should be made to parse this so that at least these urgent things that are intrinsic to the pursuit of genome research as we're doing it in these five years be addressed and addressed well first if you have to make hard decisions between good projects. Um, and, and that's not so much for the report, but it certainly was uh, part of a fairly animated discussion. Um, it's sort of beware the dilution of the roof. Uh, and I think we've talked about dilution of the effort of NHGRI away from its very core missions with respect to the first floor and the second floor, perhaps a bit more than the roof. And it's partly because we know we have to impact society, or we hope we do, in uh, enormously diverse ways. And yet, for focusing the research effort, something is going to have to be done. Um, we discussed genome relationships with the private sector. And one thing that uh, I think in the, um, in the new preamble and, and in sort of being positive in the document overall, there has been the suggestion of um, pointing to the foundation and the springboard of past accomplishments and drawing on those successes in part for inspiration and, and for sort of the style of NHGRI. And that explicitly with respect to our relationships with the private sector, there are some successes that you could wish to repeat and extend, um, not necessarily to discuss specifically in the document, but maybe to refer to one or two. The SNP consortium is certainly, uh, I think, uh, widely regarded as a success and things that subsequently flowed from it. Uh, distribution of uh, genomic reagents, um, having private companies supply libraries and act as the distribution agents works pretty well. Um, contracting for commodity services, including in some cases sequencing, has worked very nicely and is something that you'd want to do more of going into the future. Um, clearly, uh, the Genome Project's interactions with the private sector haven't all been all love and kisses. And, um, gee, that's a revelation. Uh, and, and, and that from these past difficulties, uh, um, we have probably learned a few things. Eric is saying no, it was all love and kisses. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, to go back to our roots, clearly one of the things that uh, might be worth restating in a document like this just because it will be read very widely and because people will begin to wonder how the principles of public open dissemination of data and even instantaneous dissemination of data is going to play as, as we move forward from, from a project uh, and a subject to being a discipline as we move forward from being uh, an activity of sequencing model genomes and the human genome uh, into being um, a full-blown institute in the truest sense, not just the official sense. So, so as we do that, um, this open access to data is an important part of our motivation. On the other hand, uh, it's probably not going to be universal. And addressing this issue, um, and again, the discussion went a little bit beyond what should be in this document of what people's expectations should be uh, is, is a bit of a conundrum. Um, and there are things the private sector does better. Uh, we should seek them out in practice and do them. Uh, that probably doesn't belong in the document. Um, something else that came out of our discussion was in general just, for heaven's sakes, be more positive when you're talking about what is now our roof. 
uh, there was a sense of, uh, of defensiveness. And so this had, had only to do with the fact that we had people back in the room and relatively little to do with our charge on crossover. And uh, in promise to keep it short, that's it. Okay. Questions? Comments? I think we may have talked this one to death. Okay, we'll move on then. Take right on roll. Jane Rogers will give a summary of a special topic, maintaining high standards in institutional coordination and genomics. So the charge of our special topic group was to look at um, maintaining high standards and international coordination in genomics and to remind everyone of the benefits of uh, international cooperation and, and coordination. Uh, we adjourned our meeting to, to the pub and, and held it there and, and discussion flowed freely. <laughs> so uh, despite a little noise from the karaoke people next door, I think we sort of actually managed to uh, come up with some, some points uh, of discussion here. So the Human Genome Project uh, required extensive collaboration and coordination, uh, not just internationally, but, but it, it was unusual in requiring international coordination from the outset. And uh, agreement was needed on both standards and uh, standards of, of the quality of the product that we produced. And those standards changed throughout the course of the project, uh, you may recall. Uh, from working uh, at an early, very early agreement in, in 1996 that the quality of finished sequence should be no less than one error in, in 10,000 bases, uh, to defining a quality for the working draft, and now going back to, to looking very hard at the quality standards for the, for the finished genome. In thinking about how to go forward, uh, we recognize that genome sequencing center uh, capacity has grown. We no longer need the size of co uh, consortia that, that we had for the Human Genome Project. Projects can be undertaken by, by fewer centers, but it is important to recognize that groups in other parts of the world are um, also interested in these projects and to, to work with them wh wherever uh, is possible, and, and it's certainly to, um, uh, to, to everyone's advantage to do so. So we, we then have a look at the lessons for, for, for future projects that do require collaboration. Uh, there could be projects that require participation by many, for example, uh, the, the current efforts on, on annotation of the human genome, for example, um, or simply coordination over standards for general data type generated by many, many uh, different groups. And this is particularly um, apt in, in the context of, of the plan as it's now being formulated to generate uh, information about the, the, whole, uh, the whole working genome. And in many cases, uh, coordination at some level is already occurring. This should be built on. But it's important to ensure that it can, uh, continues uh, and is fostered as, as new large data sets emerge. Okay. So some, le some particular lessons that came out of, of, of the HGP. Uh, standards are important especially in coordination, but also in getting a product out, out to the, the community that, that's usable. Uh, data release and ready access to that data, uh, Barbara already mentioned, uh, they're obvious imperatives. Uh, early, uh, data release as, as early as possible, and the HGP did set the precedent of, of releasing data uh, in, in the form of 1KB assemblies nightly, uh, which set an excellent precedent. And interestingly, it's now something everybody seems to ex accept, and I'm sure that there will be pressure 
for other data sets to be uh, released in a timely fashion. Uh, by and large, uh, groups working on a common problem figure out how they need to coordinate. Uh, they don't really need a top-down approach to, to tell them. Um, but local conditions, uh, for example, diff people with different funding agencies, scientific culture, and the size of the group do influence the outcomes. But it was felt that perhaps the most central um, coordinating factor would be the establishment of central databases for the data that's generated in different projects. And uh, they are a natural foci for, for uh, coordination of policies. And it, this can be reinforced by, by people, uh, by, by the journals, uh, encouraging or actually demanding deposition of data in central databases uh, when uh, the data are actually published. And the other, the other feeling was that the Bermuda model for coordination about standards and, and data release was a success. And I should perhaps explain that from the outset, the, the Bermuda meetings were established to bring together people who are groups throughout the world who were going to be involved or interested in, in getting funding to be involved in sequencing the human genome. There was discussion from the outset between those groups about how the project was going to be carried out, uh, what how they would operate in, in the different countries and how we could keep the coordination going. And in general, that, that was a success and we feel that there is a product that's going to be very useful coming out of this. So specifically now, looking at the a, a continuing role specifically for NHGRI, um, for large-scale sequencing, continued coordination is needed among the data producers and the funding agencies, uh, in particular to avoid redundancy. Uh, as a first uh, effort in, in along these lines, a, a meeting was held uh, at uh, Cosling Harbour this year, coordinated by the Wellcome Trust and NHGRI, to get together sequences from different countries uh, to, in the first instance, establish a database of projects that people were working on. This is still uh, in, the, in the process of being finalised, and I believe uh, a website will be set up at NHGRI where uh, the, a list of organisms that are now being sequenced and the standard to which they will be sequenced will be posted so that it's, there is information for everyone about what's being done and how they can access the data. There is an urgent need to clarify policies about pre-publication sequence data release. There is a, uh, an ongoing discussion, which I believe uh, recently had a contribution uh, published in Science uh, this week, I believe, uh, about the uh, first publication following uh, the production of a data set. Uh, the, the, one of the, the major aims in releasing data as quickly as possible that was agreed at the, begin the outset of the HDP was so that the data are available to as widely as possible. But there, there is a discussion about uh, who should be reporting on, on the quality of the data set and um, that will be taken up in a meeting that's going to be coordinated by the Wellcome Trust in January. So I hope some, some very clear policy guidelines will, will emerge from that meeting. And I should say that that's another international meeting and that the policy guidelines will then be taken back to individual uh, institutes in their own countries. Finally, plans need to be made to anticipate the future types of data uh, that will uh, need repositories. Uh, with, with David Hausler and, and you in, in in my group, there was obviously quite a lot about uh, discussion about databases that got very free-flowing. Free uh, but I think the most <laughs> firm comment to, to come through this was that there are obviously going to be a lot of data generated that we do need uh, central databases that have good access and um, some account needs to be taken now and plans need to be made for the burgeoning increase in, in sequence genomes, haplotype data, data and all the other types of data that are going to emerge. I think that's what concluded. Okay. Questions or comments? I'll raise one. I don't know if your group talked about it. One thing I, I have heard people comment on, I mean, actually, non-genomics experts, is that they often feel bewildered when they, they go to the database and they look for a sequence and they encounter sequence and, and they just don't understand and don't really data quality of that. 
in part because there's shotgun projects being done at different levels of data quality. And uh, everything you're talking about with Bermuda, there was an organizing principle behind it, and that was to sequence the human genome. What, what I'm concerned about is that with time and without the focus of human and with having sequencing being more available to lots of different groups, that there will be a lot of confusion when a, a typical biologist encounters sequence in Jamaica and not really knowing the quality of that sequence, you know, what, what, what the engine underneath it in terms of data quality and so forth. I don't know if, you, if any of your group talked about that, but... We, I think we touched on it very briefly, and, and the feeling was that this came back to the funding agencies. When, when projects are funded at the outset, they should be funded to achieve a sequence of a certain quality. We Would certainly do need to do more in terms of educating communities how to use the data. Uh, but my point is I think you're going to see the funding base may get a little bit broader. It won't just be NHGRI at NIH, and it won't just be NIH and, and so forth. So, Okay. Uh, next, Alan Williamson will summarize a discussion on public-private relationships in genomics. That was our title. That was our brief. You will see uh, from Barbara's presentation that it was also subsumed, in a sense, within the first one, which said interactions with all others, and we were uh, rather specific. Um, uh, sitting here this morning, uh, listening to the, uh, the building of the house, um, I realized that uh, with all the omics, uh, we were lacking a contribution to acronomics in this meeting. And um, so I, I, my contribution is that this is the house that Jack built, where Jack stands for joint action and collaborative know-how. Bill Galbart told me, always think of the acronym first and then see what you can fit to it. Uh, so and I think that's appropriate, actually, because um, Jack, in this case, is, is a set of partners uh, who are going to be involved in, in building this house. And it's, it, the specific brief that our workshop had to discuss was the partnerships between the public and the private um, enterprise systems. And the... We, we took this in, in sort of three ways. The, the opportunities for new partnerships. We reviewed the successes, and, and there are a number of good successes from public-private partnerships. Um, the failures in relationships were not partnerships, as I would call them. They were, they were anti-partnerships rather than uh, partnerships. Um, I think wherever true partnerships have been attempted, they, they've worked pretty well. Uh, but they've got to be put together in the right way. We discussed the barriers that uh, might uh, face us in setting these up. And uh, I should forestall that and say that I'll, I'll come to that at the major one at the end, which consumed a lot of time, and that was IP issues. Um, and, and we discussed the ways in which they can be facilitated to put them together. But let's start so that we can put those other things in context. By what did we come out with that might be possible um, proposed private partnerships. Uh, there we go, yeah. It works on a different way. So these are our PPPPs, proposed private partnerships. The first one was screening of targets arising from the study of Mendelian single uh, gene diseases. Now, as someone said this morning, only 10% of, of those Mendelian diseases have an assigned gene at the moment. And uh, the, the proposal was made from the floor that we should try to double that. Well, that's one possibility, but I would, I would also say that uh, when we were discussing this last night, I mean, we came to the conclusion that few, if any, of these 10% have what you would call a good target gene for therapeutic intervention. We may know the causative gene, but it may not be a target gene. And I think that's going to be the case for most genetic diseases, that the gene or genes, where there are many of them in complex diseases, will probably not turn out to be good drug targets. So maybe a partnership like this might attempt to come up with um, at least in one or two or three, maybe a few small number of single gene diseases, a feasible target. And the challenge then was, would large pharma companies not necessarily do the screening because, as, uh, as was pointed out, rightly so, most of them, uh, not all, but most of them have enough uh, things to fill their screens uh, several times over. Um, but would they contribute 
what they have is, which is a unique resource, and that is their small molecule collections, for screening on these targets on the basis that anything that came out could be developed in some way for these orphan diseases. Uh, it wouldn't be a commercial entity, as is pointed out in one of the preambles in the, I think it's in the health section. Um, but this might be a way to access. Now, there are clearly issues here, and I'm not saying there are any guarantees that anyone would do this, but I think it's something that's worth exploring. It's, it's sort of in there in the, in the report at the moment that maybe small molecule chemical uh, collections should be available for this. I agree with one or two people who said earlier this is a, a little naive. The really valuable collections, the really valuable assessments are not going to be made accessible because they're the crown jewels. Um, but all you get out of them is a hit. It isn't a lead compound. You've got to turn that lead into a, that hit into a lead, and that requires really good intensive medicinal chemistry. So there are a lot of issues in doing a, a partnership like this. Uh, but at least it's a, a concrete approach to some of the things that were reviewed there. The second one um, was phenotyping. There clearly is a need to bring phenotyping up to a more scientific level that genotyping is, is, is coming up to. And it's a more complex thing, and it, it relies upon the more traditional sciences, of physiology and uh, um, biochemistry, that, that tend to get swept away in the omics. Uh, so I think you know, we, we need to come back to these, and, and we need to address how to uh, do high-throughput phenotyping and turn the art of medicine into the science of medicine and define um, things properly. But to do that in the first instance, I think we, we felt that there should be some attempt to phenotype a healthy cohort. And this sort of fits in maybe with the healthy aged cohort, but maybe it should be a broader cohort. Maybe it should be something like a Framingham study, which everyone agreed uh, was an enormous success. I mean, uh, several different uh, major beneficial therapies came out of uh, data that started in Framingham. So I, th I think that phenotyping a healthy uh, cohort and then uh, also phenotyping human disease, but basically some sort of partnership to develop phenotyping tools that are essential in the healthcare industry and obviously essential in, in, in healthcare delivery and they need to be worked together, and, and uh, there's, there's room for some sort of cooperative uh, venture there. And fourthly, the more success there is, the more data there is, the more complex data sets there are, and everyone is struggling with ways of analyzing this data. So basically, development of computational uh, methods to analyze large and complex data sets, uh, industry felt there's definitely room for uh, some sort of partnership there, that these should, things should be explored. Now, how do we facilitate this? The, the point was very strongly made um, by more than one person that where partnerships have been successful, it's been because they've been developed in a joint way from fairly early stages. And the, where they would not work is if um, a central authority comes along and says, NHGRI, so just to be specific, comes along and says, we've got this great idea. Can we have some money for it? I mean, the, the people do not want to be considered as just funding partners. They want to be brought into the discussion, help put together the idea, and take it forward from the beginning. And it's sort of the way Barbara was saying about do some research on the overlaps with the other institutes. Plan ahead as to how it's done. Now, that's easier because you're all in the same place and you, you all talk to each other on a regular basis and you've got meetings set up to do this. Um, this some work has to be done to build these bridges out to, to industry and, and to potential private partners, but I think it's worthwhile because these bullets might not even be the right ones, but th along these lines, try to see what can be done. Explore out the parameters of them and see what the mutual benefits, the costs, know-how that can be brought to it from each side, and uh, how to put it together. So that's the major message uh, on facilitating. That's exploratory planning and uh, include the potential partners, all of them around the table as early as possible. On the first one, um, it, the point was uh, very strongly made that one of the advantages of working with single gene diseases is there is frequently um, a very strong action group. There may not be many patients in these diseases, but many of them have very strong patient action groups associated with them. And that's a group that should certainly be brought to the table because they facilitate access and have a lot to contribute, actually, in how you might go about this. So that's, that's critical. 
And I think it's important that um, visions and goals should be shared from the beginning and people should understand the different goals that different sides have in this. They may share the same vision, but uh, the, the, the specific goals may be different and those have got to be understood and on the table at, at the outset. So then come to barriers. Um, I mean, the, the barriers sort of... Um, dovetail with the, the facilitation, and certainly a barrier is just to ask for money. You, you, you've got to do it the, the right way. You've got to come together and decide what everyone's going to contribute. But the major barrier was, was IP, and it's, it's not necessarily a barrier. It's, it's, uh, IP is clearly necessary in many areas. Uh, it's certainly necessary in, in, in the pharmaceutical industry, but what we're talking about here is not ownership of IP, but access to the uh, elements that, uh, that are served by that. And a lot of analogies were drawn with the software industry, where there's a lot of patent pooling, where there's open access software, there are all sorts of things, and models of this sort have been talked about. I mean, clearly NIH took, under, under Harold's leadership, took a great initiative on research tools, produced marvelous statements, and it hasn't had quite the effect I think you hoped it would have, but it, it's helped. And, and we've just got to go on trying to do that, um, and to try to make access possible. And various bodies are trying to come to bear to rationalize uh, IP around the world to make access. And you've got to realize that the U.S. is in a slightly privileged position. Baidu uh, was set up to uh, foster nationalism rather than internationalism. And uh, there was, uh, you know, this, this meeting has had a somewhat U.S.-centric view to it sometimes, and I think I ought to raise that. Um, but, but at least it was agreed last night that... Um, that uh, revising by Dole in some way would not be a bad idea and looking at whether, it, you know, did it work, how, how was it meant to work, what has it done and what has its effect been on international affairs. So uh, that really is uh, the, I didn't even put the last bullet in, but IP is the, we need to be assured credit access to critical technology and that's one barrier that has to be overcome. So take questions. Comments, questions? Thanks, Eric. Bill Gall, NHGRI. I think that moving candidate molecules to lead molecules and also uh, doing the phenotyping has as its rate limiting step not so much the uh, molecules <clears throat> or even the tools, but the personnel, the, the workforce, the people who are experts uh, in the disorders. And I think that's something that our institute and other institutes can work on. In other words, training these folks. And I would add at a relatively uh, low cost uh, as well, you know, compared to some of the other numbers that we're talking about. So I think we need to develop mechanisms to do that uh, better. Good. Uh, one thing I, I heard last night that uh, really seemed like a, a good idea, um, the, um, the, the success of the SNP consortium uh, it can be attributed in part to the fact that Arthur Holden was running it uh, as a CEO who talks the talk, walks the walk, and is intelligible to other business CEOs, not by a government official or a professor or anybody like that, but a real honest-to-gosh CEO. It seems that an opportunity exists now for a more ambitious effort uh, led by um, a CEO type. That particular thing is the development of software tools to better understand genomic and fun let's call it functional genomic data. Uh, each pharma company has a group of informaticians who uh, busily buy software products from outside and patch them together and write their own code, reinventing the wheel in how to analyze, say, gene expression data. Um, Silicon Valley is, uh, if not awash, is well supplied now with, uh, with, with idealistic youngish people who would like to work, uh, who, who are pro talented computer programmers who would like to work on software that they thought would help people understand biology. However, they need a management structure. They need uh, a, um, something run by a CEO with, uh, with managers and deputy managers and all those levels that animate programmers. There's an opportunity here for a consortium to start generating some of this software. It could be an international consortium. It would have substantial buy-in from business. It would need to be run by uh, professional business people, but uh, I think it could attract a lot of support including um, a large number of the people who could actually do the programming and make the tools available to uh, corporations and academic researchers. 
Yeah, in, in a sense, that was meant to be subsumed within the last bullet. And, and, I, and I think, you know, having been involved in, in, in the birth of the SNP consortium, I'd be the first to pay enormous tribute to, to Arthur and, and what he's done to run it. And I think, uh, but I've also been involved with a lot of different biotech companies uh, over the last few years. And there are good CEOs and there are not so good CEOs. And, you know, so you've got to get a good CEO in there. And in this case, Arthur had just the right light touch dealing with... Uh, uh, prima donnas, let's say, uh, heads of sequencing centers, I think they're called, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, making things happen. In, in, in <laughs> oh, they don't have egos. <laughs> right, one more question. Thank you. Um, I'm Suzanne Patty with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and I come to this meeting as a patient and as an advocate for the patient community. But also, um, I wanted to ask for a little more elaboration from you on what the group discussed last night about bringing in patient advocacy groups um, beyond just facilitating access. One of my previous jobs, I was with the biotechnology industry organization, and um, I was responsible for doing outreach with patient advocacy groups to bring them specifically into the biotechnology industry and to encourage earlier collaboration than having the community consulted once a product was developed and access was needed to be facilitated. And last week or two, I was at a clinical research roundtable with the Institute of Medicine. And there was an excellent presentation about the ability of Genentech to work with the breast cancer community to provide them with scientific information on the development of Herceptin and to have the community provide direct scientific input to the development of that product and not just to, and to help with clinical trial recruitment significantly and not just to the development of access once the product is, is um, developed. So I wanted to wonder, I wondered what you guys got into more last night with this act, with this activity. Let, let me just ask you, has your experience been good or bad in this? I think both, and I think, um, I think the biotech community, for the most part, is realizing that it's important to step out. There have been some good um, other examples, like the development of thalidomide for other types of uses than just the, mm -hmm. with, with protections yeah. in place, yeah. and the need to consult the community initially to get that product developed in a safe way. So there definitely needs to be more, but also I'm looking at the around the room today, and there isn't a broad representation from the disability or patient advocacy community here today. So I guess I'd, I'd like to see that broadened as well. Yeah, I, I gave access as an example, but I did say that the, those communities, and it was touched upon, not extensively, but that the, they have a vast amount of community. I don't know whether Jeff Dyke is, is in, the, in the room. Is he? Where's Jeff? He, he brought up a collaboration that they had uh, with, with, and it gave that a specific example of where it had been very good in terms of the planning and, and help, and, and that was a sort of a model that... Uh, um, we, we drew upon and um, agreed that in any, in any disease situation, if there was a good patient uh, representative group, then they ought to be involved in the planning from the early stage. Thank you. Okay. I think in the interest of time, we'll move on. Next, Carol Varmus will give a summary of a discussion on genomics and the developing world. Okay, sorry for the delay. Um, so our group had an animated conversation about the role of genomics in the developing world, inspired, I think, by three general ideas. First, that I think we all agreed that genomics has a lot to offer as a foundation science for improving both economic and health conditions in the developing world. Secondly, the culture of the genomic enterprise, the Human Genome Project, has been one that uh, has been global in character. Sharing has been a major component of it. Uh, and uh, it has inspired a certain sense that we are one world and we share a genome and that, that uh, the concerns of parts of the world that have not traditionally played a major role in the advanced economies, economies as they do science do deserve such a role. And thirdly, the excitement that surrounded the announcement of the human genome uh, quasi-completion uh, has been uh, a, a, a way of, uh, of generating interest in science per se and inspiring efforts to develop science in those parts of the world. 
And we tried to focus our conversation around three broad questions. A lot more could have been asked. But first, we wanted to talk about the ways, the specific ways in which genomic sciences, not all sciences or even the sciences that build on genomics, but genomic sciences per se, could help uh, developing countries. Secondly, what would be needed to facilitate the introduction of those sciences into the developing countries? This, you know, we we take, make the assumption, I'll discuss in a moment, that a lot of the science will be done in advanced parts of the world. But if you're going to do this, what, what's needed to make this science a way of building uh, the long-needed pockets of science throughout the countries that, uh, that have been uh, having trouble establishing it in the past? And then, of course, what should uh, our host's role be in supporting uh, genomics in those countries? So we had an animated discussion about uh, the kinds of things that could be done. And I think uh, some of these things, of course, are not necessarily in the purview of the NIH. Uh, a lot of attention given to uh, nutrition and agriculture uh, and the idea of sequencing useful genomes, uh, particularly cereals, the, the, the foods that provide 70% of the nutrition in many parts of the world, uh, rice, almost done, corn, sorghum, others. Um, and the idea here is to improve uh, plant breeding, uh, to facilitate genetic modification. Um, there are other organisms that might be subject to uh, to the study of genomes, including organisms that infect plants and other agricultural organisms, uh, including animals, uh, organisms that infect human beings and cause disease in those parts of the world, the vectors that transmit those agents. Uh, then sequencing genomes of exotic living forms that might be a way of, of enriching uh, the, uh, uh, the, the economies of, of, of these nations. Uh, and then, of course, building all that, all, on all that to encourage useful genome-based projects of many kinds. Uh, one example of uh, what this all means, embodied in the example of malaria, a good target for global genomics. Global in this, in this, in this uh, talk, uh, David, doesn't mean genome-wide. It means the whole world. Uh, <laughs> and um, obviously, this is a useful example to think about. Obvious health implications, very strong economic implications that build upon the need to develop healthier economies. Many nations don't invest in certain parts of the world because all their employees will get malaria if they go there. Uh, the genomes that, that, uh, that make this disease possible have been nearly sequenced uh, and all reported. Plasmodium, a couple of species have been done. Anopheles, the vector, uh, the target for human disease. Uh, there are many strategies for use of that information. And there is, unlike the situation for most diseases of the developing world, strong advocacy, some of it emerging from the NIH and other funding agencies, exemplified by uh, the, multi the multilateral initiative on malaria, but the other uh, uh, advocacy groups fostered by the World Health Organization and others. Now, I think all of us in the room believe that the NIH and other funders should pay more attention to projects in the domain of genomic science that uh, could help uh, economies and health in, in the developing world. Those projects could obviously be done in the advanced countries, and many of them are being done there, but you know, the argument could easily be made, although our conversation didn't go in that direction, for doing more of it. But if it's going to be done in the developing world, there's some, some concerns to address. These are, in a sense, boilerplate concerns, important, valid, and so forth, but they emerge any time one talks about doing more science in the developing world. Training of scientists who are going to work in those places, especially from local populations, uh, funding of the science, naturally. Uh, collaborations with scientists in the, developed, in the developed world, obviously important. When you go to these places, you learn that political support for these endeavors is crucial. Partnerships you just heard about, and the NGOs, uh, uh, from, from Bill Gates to, uh, uh, to um, advocacy groups for specific diseases, play a major role here. Industry has a role to play. It's too uh, cumbersome to try to explore in the five minutes I have been assigned. Uh, one needs ways to attract scientists from those countries back to the countries. And that means having laboratories and domestic situations, education for their kids that, that allow them to return. Um, it's helpful to make the science cheaper. I'll come back to that point in a moment. Decline, the decline in the cost of sequencing would help. Uh, attention to, to many social and legal issues, of course, is crucial. And some of these, uh, especially intellectual property and attitudes toward genetics and genetically modified organisms, is absolutely fundamental to trying to pursue genomic sciences in these countries. A very important feature that was emphasized by many around our discussion table is the importance of being connected by email uh, by, and by access to, to the scientific literature. 
some organizations, including the NIH, are to be commended for, for efforts like PubMed and PubMed Central that help. Uh, Biomed Central, a private organization that makes global free access. Some journals have made some of their um, publications available to, um, to uh, the poorest countries in the world. That's to be commended as well. Um, but uh, clearly, we're very deficient in getting uh, the full repertoire of what we do, paid for by NIH and many other organizations, to parts of the world that could do science if, that, if some of these conditions were met. Now, what kinds of specific things need to be done to have developing science, have, have genomic science, and for that matter, other kinds of science as well, done in developing countries? We've all recognized here in many times the importance of genome sequencing centers. And if one is going to do genomic science and things related to it, maybe not simply sequencing, but genotyping of insects and other kinds of things, you need centers, especially in countries where the scientific uh, expertise is slim and widely distributed. You need to bring it together into a coherent place where people can talk to each other. An example, uh, uh, in Bamako, Mali, a center for malaria research and training founded by the uh, one proponent of the NIH, not the one we're here um, uh, uh, paying our bills today, but another institute, the AI, AID, uh, in collaboration with USAID. And, um, this is a, the kind of thing that's done. They, the the genomic, genomics there at this point is, is simply looking at, at chromosomes and doing karyotyping on, on some genetic marker studies on, on insects uh, isolated in different parts of, uh, of Mali. Uh, a second issue is getting more scientists from advanced countries into these places, not just as helicopter scientists, but people going in and staying for protracted periods, doing some training uh, and, uh, and learning the culture. Uh, an example of what that might mean uh, is provided by the history of genetics, the predecessor to genomics. Uh, many of you probably don't know that J.B.S. Haldane, uh, one of the founders of our field, spent the last nine years of his life uh, doing corn genetics and other forms of genetics and archaeology and anthropology as well uh, in India with his wife, who was also a geneticist. Uh, so this is a way for superannuated scientists who no longer can get their R01s <laughs> to, uh, to practice their, their, their wares in a very beneficial and stimulating se uh, 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 situation. Some of us, you know, we just, we're doing the same experiment over and over again. We need to change the pace. We need to focus on a different kind of disease. We might do better work. There are other things. Uh, developing low-cost technology, I've mentioned, and specific aims to do that could be incorporated into the, into the, into the plan that you're developing here. Uh, making uh, more international workshops, some held in developing countries to stimulate work of the kind we're talking about, and free ac access publishing and archiving needs to be much more widespread. And there are efforts like the Public Library of Science that many of you are familiar with. That's an effort to not only advocate for, but uh, develop the free access journals. So what should the role of, of the Genome Institute be? Well, two of these are sort of applehood. Uh, one is in, you know, trying to increase activity in these domains at all institutes by persuasiveness, working through Dr. Z and others, uh, and working with the Fogarty International Center, which has this as an explicit uh, goal. Uh, focusing attention on the LC problems, which are going to be fundamental to doing research in many of the countries we're talking about. Um, two specific things came up in our discussion I thought were particularly interesting. One is to advertise grants for developing, for example, uh, genotyping methods that would be particularly cheap and facile uh, in countries where they could be used for instance, for doing uh, genetic epidemiology and other kinds of things uh, uh, on, on uh, for example, uh, strains of, uh, of infectious uh, uh, organisms. Um, these kinds of things would have a big impact, first of all, because the development of the methods would be useful everywhere, uh, that they would be an important foundation for building science in these countries. And the final point is to use existing projects that are in the Genome Institute that have an international character, like the HapMap project, um, or new programs. Uh, to build collaborations with scientists in the developing countries and try to enhance the, the infrastructure of research locally. I'd be happy to take some questions. Okay. Questions, comments? Ewan. Um, I, I, uh, I have sort of responsibility of the Anopheles genome uh, in terms of information at the moment, and it's been a, it's been amazing actually how uh, productive scientists can be in developing countries out of from the information base. One thing to remember about the genome is that it, the export is predominantly information 
Uh, and if you can export the information, you really empower the scientists. I've been incredibly impressed by the sort of science that goes on as well in the developing countries. I think there's a tendency to think that it's somehow second rate. It's, it's not second rate. Um, and I'd like to add that I really feel that the internet access is one of the, is, is a surprisingly stupid bottleneck to the developing countries. It's a stupid bottleneck to have because otherwise there'll be so much information to these scientists there. So I'd really like to emphasize that point. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much. Barbara? Um, <clears throat> first, I'd like to say that I think it's wonderful that a field struggling with its adolescence uh, considers what to do with its superannuated practitioners. Um, There's room for adolescence too, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> it makes my future feel good. Anyway, uh, but what I was going to ask about, I don't think any of the people who I've heard suggest this are here, and I don't know if your group considered it, but I've heard the idea floated several times in the way of this uh, impact on the rest of the world. Uh, that as we draw um, in the private sector as well as in the public sector, but especially in the private sector, uh, things that are eventually, eventually lead to treatments, drugs, and profit from, among other things, the genomes of um, chimps, gorillas, etc., that it might be appropriate to take some very small fraction of that profit and send it back to the struggling areas where habitat preservation is a huge issue uh, and a compelling one. And I have further heard that when people have uh, floated this issue in downtown Washington where something might be done, um, it's been uh, laughed at uh, as being, you know, totally, there's just good idea. No way it's going to happen. We don't care. Now, I don't know whether any moral suasion coming from this sector to even consider it seriously as part of our roof uh, is appropriate, but it uh, seems to me like it's worth a thought. It's a good thought. Um, I'm reminded of uh, an effort I made uh, in front of the leaders of all the pharmaceutical industries to suggest that, that all of them that have um, bonanza drugs that make more than $500 million in a single year put the money above a certain level, uh, maybe or 10 percent above a certain level, into a, into a bank on a kind of tithing system. And that money would be used to, to found a kind of inter, an inter-industrial company that would work on diseases of, of disadvantaged countries. If they made money, some of that money would go back to the companies, um, but it was a way of uh, trying, you know, trying to think about the same thing, to take excess profits and pile them back in. But you know, we, we did discuss some of these things, the, the, the educational problems, the ethical sensitivities to some of the things you're mentioning. Actually, we consider the first barrier that you know, getting the money back is, I think, possible but difficult. One yeah. more. Uh, a, uh, just a, a point that came up last night. Uh, Clearly, the uh, problems of nutrition and infectious disease are important in the third world, but that the leading problems, uh, health problems in the third world are still heart disease and stroke, and uh, application of genomics to those problems and then taking the fruits of that research to the third world you know, is something that would be worthwhile. Right. If you look at the, the World Health Organization's Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, which was just published last year on the leadership of Jeff Sachs, you'll see an analysis of, this, of these issues. And what the, the commission tended to focus on were those diseases that we thought had low-cost remediation in the short run. And I think that's an important issue. I think you know, the, the kinds of things that we're, we're doing in this country with cancer and heart disease and stroke and mental illness are going to be important, and translating whatever solutions we come to to, the, to these parts of the world will be a, a very important endeavor. So I appreciate your comment. Okay. I think we will move on. Uh, next speaker is Paul Miller discussing uh, public policy priorities for the NHGRI. Oh, yeah, sure. First, uh, let me explain as, as maybe the only uh, one of the few lawyers in the room, I am hoping that by the time of Arley three meeting, uh, Congress will fund uh, my little small agency so we can afford PowerPoint and present some <laughs> very fancy slides. Um, it seems very as exciting to me as the genome project itself. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we have a handout. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, uh, Barbara Fuller from the NHGRI, who was our scribe and, and who um, 
typed uh, uh, faster than I've seen anybody uh, uh, type and who was uh, critical to uh, pulling this together. The purpose and goal of our discussion last night was to look both backwards and forwards over the landscape of public policy leadership that NHGRI has been engaged in and in a sense to decide where we um, go from here in a sense maybe a little bit of what that roof might look like. We spent a lot of, uh, a bit of time in the beginning talking about what is um, policy in the LC context and um, maybe it was because of the participants in the room or maybe just the nature of where the LC program has been. We've, we were most comfortable in talking about policy in the context of federal legislative and executive branch issues. That was primarily our focus and yet um, we acknowledge that policy, LC policy um, in this context needs to be much broader um, than simply worrying about Congress and the executive branch agencies and so we need to, um, in a sense, we, we made an effort to break out and I think that the program needs to make an effort as important as um, uh, federal legislative policy is to break out of that um, box um, to include such issues as, as sort of thinking about state regulatory issues, uh, professional standards and policy, um, education and international issues. The, the lens in, in trying to think about LC policy, the lens through which the public policy agenda needs to be developed in that is that public policy should facilitate the genetic science. We thought that that was a pretty important theme in focusing um, the L LC uh, program. Policy has to be grounded in NHGRI's science research. Even though science can inform policy, um, it's a loop. And so that policy also um, informs science. So it's a feedback loop, but that's one way of, of grounding um, the program. We talked through some of the historical ways in which NHGRI does policy, primarily through funding specific uh, research and specific issues, consensus panel approaches, um, and so on and so forth. Um, however, we acknowledge and we talked about that there's been a limited ability to have LC research inform policy development, particularly legislative policy, that the research somehow has a difficult way of translating itself into sort of more generic policy. And the challenge that NHGRI faces is how to make those research policy papers, those research papers that it funds relevant to the policy process. And so maybe just because a bunch of uh, ethicists want to carry badges, we came up with this notion of an LC SWAT team, um, which in a sense is a quick response team of experts who have a mastery of the library of, 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 of information, of, of knowledge of issues, who are available to inform the legislative process in real time. When Congress decides to pick up an issue or when the state decides to pick up an issue, there's no time in a sense for going back and funding a research progress, um, you know, um, program. We need to have real time people who are available to policymakers to make this all make sense and to be involved and we have to think of a way of translating the ELSI program so it's um, really, um, relevant and along those lines um, at the legislative level the opportunity to capture the attention of policy making bodies is very very limited thus um, the um, d d leadership and strategic thinking is critical um, in these issues and the notion that uh, NHGRI is uniquely situated to take the broad view of the policy impact of the genomic revolution within the federal government and beyond and is an organizing body by which it can step up to the place, not, plate not representing any particular um, um, position but really bring people together within the federal government and so on and the same is reaching out to um, uh, stakeholders. Prime directive um, 
and we, we spent a lot of time talking about how NHGRI must be cognizant and respectful of its stakeholders, the audience for policy, and that sometimes that um, uh, should not get lo lost, both in terms of what stakeholders are looking for and how NHGRI reaches out and talks to um, stakeholders, thinking about the end users of um, policy, and in that sense, um, really creating an outreach model rather than just uh, an outreach strategic model rather than simply a reactive model to whoever walks into our door with a, with a proposal for a grant or with an idea or in response to a grant, but really reaching out to stakeholders in a proactive and strategic way. Um, along those lines, not to let big P politics dictate NHGRI's policy agenda. It is certainly irrelevant as you move along but not to short circuit the brainstorming because something might be politically difficult or, or, or uh, nuclear or what have you. Prime directive for developing policy, um, NHGRI stature and influence um, decreases exponentially the further it gets away from genome science. And that's a very, very important theme to um, consider and to ask this one thing. Whatever the policy initiative is, does it get in the way of people taking advantage of this remarkable science? Again, that's the, in a sense, an organizing um, principle for thinking about what might be appropriate policy and so on. Um, we talked about education. We talked about um, the need for empirical data, particularly within the legislative um, process. Um, and lastly, again, this sort of goes towards the leadership role and, uh, uh, of NHGRI, and, and that is many professional organizations have developed their own policies, their own um, you know, thoughts on lots of these um, issues that are LC issues, either with NHGRI funding or without, and there is no way of really, uh, nobody has yet really collected analyzed and disseminated these policy statements, making them more accessible to stakeholders, thinking through the different ways that um, um, different organizations have thought about these issues. And that is a valuable um, uh, a resource and leadership role um, that, we thought, um, that we thought that NHGRI could, um, could provide. At the end of our little handout, we went sort of a, a catch-all list of just some ideas, some issues, policy issues that, um, that might be relevant to put on a policy agenda. And in the interest of time, um, uh, you can sort of read through that. I thought that the process and structure and thematic perspective of our conversation was more important to relate to you. Questions and comments? Great, thank you. Okay, in the interest of time, we will move on. And our last uh, summary leader is uh, Maynard Olson, who's discussing uh, the study and the genetic basis of the healthy phenotype. The background to this special topic uh, really had to do with one of the main themes of this meeting, which uh, had to do with really what is the NHR going to do on the second floor of Jack's house. The, there are a number of questions there, and they've been vigorously discussed for a couple of days, uh, but a lot of them really hinge around the relative role of the NHGRI and other entities, uh, particularly other NIH institutes and uh, the private industry. Uh, so, in a general way, uh, I, I think the, the motivation for, for the second floor and for indeed a major emphasis of the NHGRI in the future in this area uh, is, is the clear one that, that there's a responsibility in this institute to, uh, to, to deliver on the promises that have been associated with the Human Genome Project for 
for better health. But one of the motives here was to try to explore with a, a little uh, greater specificity uh, examples of how that might be done. Uh, there has, of course, been the strongly uh, articulated view that the role of the NHGRI, its core role, is uh, providing uh, data sets and new technologies that can be used widely in exploring uh, uh, avenues to better health, uh, for example, by other institutes. Uh, but I, I think that uh, it's important in just looking at the context of this special topic uh, to, to appreciate a, a couple of difficulties with that generalization. Uh, one of them is that I think it's clear that as data sets and technologies move somewhat away from their very generic roots, uh, the reference sequence of the human genome, uh, efficient sequencing, efficient genotyping, uh, it is simply going to be essential uh, that these data sets and technologies uh, be developed uh, in a way that's, that's driven by real applications. That's how you get uh, innovative technology. You don't get it by abstracting it uh, far away uh, from the intended application. And I think there's also a sense that there may be some structural barriers uh, in, in just the way that biomedical research is done uh, to the vigorous exploration of paths to new therapies uh, that cut broadly across disease categories and, and actually don't have a natural vigorous home uh, in any one. Uh, categorical institute. So that, that was the context and uh, really I, I saw at least this discussion as, as uh, an effort to, uh, to take a first look at, at something I, I would present as an existence proof uh, that there are areas of this type that the NHGRI might profitably explore on the second floor. Uh, so Lisa Brooks did an outstanding job uh, late last night after I went to the pub uh, preparing these uh, PowerPoint slides and they, they involve uh, the potential uh, benefits of increasing our investment in studies of the genetic basis of what we uh, decided to call uh, disease resistant uh, uh, phenotypes. Uh, I'll come back at, at the end very briefly to the broader issue of healthy phenotypes. Uh, so the, the discussion uh, was guided uh, based on, uh, on earlier uh, input from the Genomes to Health workshop uh, along the lines of, of a fairly specific proposal uh, whose main uh, motivation are some quite clear examples in the infectious disease area about how there has been a very profitable focus on the genetics of resistance as opposed to the genetics of disease susceptibility, uh, which has clearly been the uh, dominant activity, uh, not just at, at NHGRI related research, but broadly in the biomedical uh, research community. Uh, two just uh, dramatic examples are actually a long list from the infectious disease area are the well-known uh, uh, finding of a relatively frequent allele in some populations of the CCR5 gene and all alleles. Uh, which when homozygous leads to essentially absolute resistance to HIV infection. And, and indeed there are drugs in clinical trials which are, are really based uh, directly on this observation. Uh, and uh, an, another uh, example which uh, to my knowledge has not been pursued pharmaceutically but certainly could uh, is the uh, long-standing observation that, uh, that uh, a uh, homozygosity for a regulatory mutation which eliminates expression of the so-called dark gene, the Duffy antigen receptor for chemokines on erythrocytes uh, leads to essentially absolute resistance to vivox malaria. And, uh, and indeed this allele is nearly fixed in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So really the, the focus of our workshop is, uh, is there uh, room to try to extend uh, this model uh, more broadly uh, beyond infectious diseases. The, there are some interesting points uh, about disease variants that have uh, properties uh, quite different uh, from disease susceptibility alleles. And, uh, our basic uh, definition of them is that in some sense they're just the, the flip side of disease variants and uh, there was actually a lot of discussion about really how, uh, wh what that means, how you, how you measure these disease resistant phenotypes. Uh, but, the, but the basic notion is that they provide resistance to disease under uh, such that people with these genotypes do well under circumstances, environmental or genetic background, uh, where others do poorly. And that, uh, that there may be uh, unique opportunities to 
uh, exploit the study of this class of genetic variants for developing new therapies. And, uh, and really the core of this idea, and I, I have only uh, uh, two more minutes and so I have, have to oversimplify, but the core of this idea uh, is in the first uh, proposition here that most disease variants, uh, clearly there are exceptions, and uh, most current drugs, again there are exceptions, uh, reduce the production or function of a, of a gene product. And, uh, and it's clear that this uh, loss of function is indeed hard to correct and that that in some sense is at the core of the dilemma which uh, Alan Williamson uh, referred to of, of, of taking uh, molecular information about uh, disease susceptibility and, uh, and even uh, building any rational path toward therapy, uh, at least any path, rational path other than gene therapy itself. Uh, so the idea is that uh, understanding protective mechanisms might uh, lead more directly to the identification of drug, drug targets because the idea now is to make small molecule drug uh, which in a, in a person with a normal genotype uh, actually mimics uh, the effect of the disease resistant mutation and that indeed has been exactly the strategy in the CCR5 case. Uh, and there's also the point that the, the genetics themselves actually provide some of one class of information that's extremely valuable to, uh, to the pharmaceutical industry, uh, which is that it gives a, a human model, if you like, uh, for the effects of eliminating uh, that gene uh, product. And in the CCR5 case, it was particu of particular interest to the pharmaceutical industry that CCR5 Delta 32 uh, homozygotes uh, have, have, as nearly has so far been ascertained after quite a bit of study, uh, completely normal phenotypes. Is whatever defect is associated with missing this gene product is quite subtle under most environmental conditions. So that's the, uh, the core of the idea. Uh, there are numerous uh, challenges. Uh, we're supposed to call these uh, challenges rather than problems <laughs> associated <laughs> with uh, implementing this type of idea and much of our discussion uh, focused on them. Really at the very core of it is that people with resistant variants do not show up at clinics. Uh, the whole history of biomedical research is really a history of having uh, uh, provided healthcare services uh, which attract people with diseases and we gradually built up this whole wonderful system of institutes and uh, medical schools around these clinics and uh, we draw blood and so forth as these people come through for uh, medical treatment and even very rare diseases uh, then present by this route uh, for study. Uh, people that, uh, that aren't sick and uh, doing well uh, don't show up at these clinics. And, uh, and indeed, we, we lack uh, mechanisms by and large to ascertain them uh, in society. And uh, so there are, are numerous uh, uh, approaches to, uh, to this challenge. Uh, there was a discussion, of course, that uh, geneticists in, have been doing uh, this type of thing in the context of, uh, of modifiers and uh, lack of penetrance. Uh, so that's an interesting strategy is, is essentially looking at relatives of affected individuals and, and uh, people that as we have an increasing ability to genotype uh, uh, everyone and extended families to, to take more seriously the challenge of understanding uh, uh, lack of penetrance in, in uh, severe uh, diseases. Uh, but I also really w would just uh, like to emphasize that, that, that we undoubtedly could come up with clever new ideas and there, there were actually some very interesting ones uh, presented last night but this is not the time to discuss them. I, I think really this is a problem that our best geneticists and just, uh, best genomicists and indeed broadly the biomedical research community has actually not thought about very hard and one thing the NHGRI could do would be to stimulate uh, some you know, very bright and experienced people thinking hard about this problem. Uh, and so there were a few ideas uh, about uh, how, how to approach this and I've, I've listed them uh, here. The, uh, the point being that, uh, that, that, that I think that this list of examples uh, could uh, increase rapidly if there were more focus on, on the potential of this area. Uh, a lot, we're, we're in the process just for example to take uh, studying both ends of the phenotypic uh, distributions. We're in the process of turning uh, most diseases or trying hard to turn most diseases into quantitative traits, preclinical pre uh, 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 symptoms if you like or preclinical uh, uh, phenotypes 
uh, are uh, under very intensive study and, and we're getting better and better ones uh, for many disease processes. And as you turn uh, disease processes into quantitative traits, then setting the, uh, the uh, disease resistant uh, end of the spectrum is uh, going to be increasingly effective. Uh, clearly, other institutes should be involved, and uh, we've already had quite a bit of discussion of the point that the NHGRI should not be doing it alone uh, in, uh, in setting uh, uh, phenotypes that are already under intensive investigation uh, elsewhere at the NIH. Uh, but I, I think there was a sentiment, uh, clear sentiment in this group that that doesn't mean that the NHGRI should just simply keep its hands off. Uh, studies that involve phenotyping, involve recruiting uh, uh, human subjects and, uh, and uh, att attempting uh, to, to do uh, genomic studies that uh, are on this kind of more direct path to uh, therapy development. Uh, there will, for example, uh, as in many other uh, relatively new areas of research, be uh, unique uh, LC uh, issues that, uh, that need attention. So that's it. Questions? Uh, Wayne Frankel from the Jackson Lab. Um, so not supposed to be hobby horse, but one issue, one area that we're, could help is uh, use of animal models for uh, looking at resistance. Yes, no, it's a good point, and I, I really should have mentioned it. There was considerable discussion of the potential of animal models, especially mice, uh, where, where there is, of course, uh, people have been quite struck uh, by the, the genetic background dependence of many uh, uh, knockout phenotypes. And uh, that's a, a clear indication that, that uh, model organisms could be used more intensively than they are now uh, to focus on, on uh, genetic background effects. Richard. So, uh, Maynard, the, you know, the chemokine receptor mutations weren't found by a genomic approach. They were found by a functional traditional biological approach. Does that change your view at all? Or uh, you know, no, it really doesn't. Uh, I mean, you know, m most, uh, you know, the, the, uh, there, were, there were a lot of human mutations uh, that had been uh, identified and uh, associated with phenotypes uh, before there was any genomics or any ability to do human linkage. It, it's just that it's a highly knowledge-driven uh, activity. It was uh, detailed knowledge of how HIV infects uh, human cells that made CCR5 a candidate gene in those studies. Uh, the uh, point of genomics is that uh, if you look at the, you know, at, the, at the fraction of interesting human phenotypes that yielded uh, to just guesswork, uh, it, was, it was low. And uh, the, the genomics has brought to the table the, what uh, Eric uh, Lander once called an ignorance-based approach <laughs> to uh, looking for what genes are responsible for what phenotypes. And uh, my, my own view of this uh, subject is, is that, uh, that, that there is a, a kind of whole human genetics out there to be discovered uh, that is essentially the mirror image of the human genetics that's described in OMIM, for example. Okay. Well, I'd like to actually thank the six uh, discussant leaders and actually for great presentations and <laughs> so forth. And I will now turn uh, the rest of the, the events over to Francis. Well, I would certainly echo uh, your applause there uh, for the special topics presenters. I thought that was a remarkably interesting set of topics and well presented. And clearly, those are some of the uh, conclusions that we will need to figure out how to fold into the uh, final version of this document that we've all been wrestling with, and I promise you we will try to do our best to capture uh, some of those uh, very interesting ideas. Uh, my task here, and it won't take me half an hour, it will be something less than that, but we're not quite sure yet how much, uh, is to try to pull together uh, where we have come from over the course of the last, uh, say, 38 hours or so, uh, and uh, particularly um, where we might then take it next in order to try to distill this uh, into an exciting, compelling uh, document uh, that conveys uh, where genomic research could most usefully go next. 
I couldn't help as we've been here at this meeting to think back on the last time we had an early house meeting to plan the future of genome research. Uh, the month was May of 1998. It was a tumultuous time. Uh, the goals of the Genome Project, as outlined in the original Alberts document, uh, were within sight of being accomplished if we turned our attention in the most vigorous and energetic way uh, towards scaling up of sequencing and a host of other related activities. And yet, at that very moment, uh, there was quite a visible threat uh, to the possibility of the Genome Project ever actually being able uh, to go forward in that fashion because of other events which I'm happy to say now seem to have sunk fairly far back in the fog of history, at least for most people's uh, attentions. And here at this meeting, we really haven't paid much attention at all uh, to that particular uh, unsettling chapter that uh, happened those four and a half years ago because I think it's fair to say whatever that was all about, uh, things have turned out pretty darn well. And we now have in the public domain a very far advanced uh, sequence of the human genome uh, a variety of other genome sequences pouring out on lots of other interesting organisms, uh, technologies that continue to advance, uh, many goals that were not part of the original Alberts plan, such as a detailed study of genetic variation, already uh, well on the way uh, towards producing extremely useful data sets that are going to advance our ability to understand how the genome works, uh, ways in which we are studying genome function, which were not anticipated. Uh, low those 12 years ago in which are already now yielding uh, fascinating observations that allow us both to understand biology and to understand mechanisms of disease. Uh, so thinking back on that time four and a half years ago, it's amazing uh, how far we have come uh, in that interval. But I think this is also important to reflect on because this has been a very different meeting than that one was and not just because of the historical events that were happening in May of 98 but because the goal here that we've been dealing with for these two days is a very different one. Uh, in, in 98 and prior to that in 93 when we were meeting together to try to lay out the specific five-year milestones, we were very much guided by an overall blueprint of what we thought the Genome Project uh, could and should accomplish. And essentially, uh, we are now in a circumstance of being able to say it worked. It worked remarkably well. It's coming in sooner than expected. And we have that foundation of the building uh, that is now represented uh, in the uh, house that Jack built or whoever is building it uh, that we are now using uh, as our symbol uh, of genomics of the future. So it's been said before, but I want to say it once again. This meeting is very different. This meeting is really much more like what happened uh, with that much smaller group back in 1988 uh, that Bruce Alberts chaired uh, that tried to put together a much more ambitious and dramatic kind of plan about how to move a whole new discipline into the future. Uh, we have the opportunity uh, to do that again, and I think you all have been doing it remarkably well. And I want to say a few things about what I think we have taken away from this uh, in terms of some of the major themes, hopefully without repeating things that have already been said, because I think we've had a fair number of uh, summaries in various forms already you know, that have been quite eloquent and articulate. Uh, first of all, let me say, with regard to the document, I think you did make it very clear that what we brought to you in advance of this meeting, uh, while it had content in it that I have largely heard uh, mostly endorsed in terms of the specific areas uh, that we called critical elements, the ones that were the focus of NHGRI anyway, uh, most people have felt that is a pretty good representation of where the exciting science opportunities are. On the other hand, uh, it was very clear that the formulation and the presentation did not do a service uh, to the excitement uh, that we uh, all feel about this and, and which we'd like to convey uh, to the rest of the scientific community. And in that regard, not to be defensive, but I think our document uh, went through uh, probably too many revisions before you saw it. Uh, in fact, I don't know what draft we were on, but I know it was well into the 20s uh, by the time it came to you. Uh, and uh, many hours had been spent on that, and many people had had their fingers on it. Uh, and it had benefited from the output of all the workshops that we told you about, those dozen or so over the last year. But that meant that all of those uh, particular outputs felt some need to be included, uh, and many of them were perhaps in a way that did not uh, achieve the prioritization that a document of this sort might have. And in that regard, this looked a bit like a document written by a committee. And we all know the definition of a committee. Uh, a, com a committee is a group of individuals who represent a cul-de-sac uh, down which good ideas are lured and quietly strangled. <laughs> so 
So um, we may have suffered a bit uh, by that particular kind of occasion, but I think we've recovered from it quite nicely in the last couple of days by the fact that you all are not shy in retiring, and you have pointed out quite accurately uh, opportunities uh, to fix this. Uh, I told you the story on Monday night about Wolfgang Pauli and the uh, postcard he sent uh, to his friend, the postcard containing uh, a diagram which was basically the, uh, only the frame of what might have been a wonderful work of art. Uh, Pauli at the time being uh, somewhat irritated by his colleague Werner Heisenberg, who said he developed a unified field theory that pulled together all the forces of the universe, except he had a few details to work out. And uh, Pauli's uh, comment was, well, he could paint like Titian, except he had still a few details to work out, and that's why the canvas was blank at the time. Well, I don't think we presented you with a blank canvas, but I think we presented you with a canvas uh, where the images were perhaps a little scrambled and not as appealing to the eye as they might have been. And thanks to you, we now have the chance to go back with our paintbrushes and, and redo this image in a fashion that looks hopefully more like a classic of one of the old masters. I don't know if it'll be impressionist or whatever, but it will have, uh, I think, much more substance uh, to it. And for those who look at it, a chance to inspire uh, will be greatly aided by all of this. So a few comments. This new version, including all the elements I talked about at the beginning of the morning, such as a preamble that really goes into uh, some of the passion and the excitement, uh, will be concise to a level that the current version is not. In fact, we had been wondering, because we do want to publish this next April in a prominent place, and obviously the, uh, the document you saw it was much too long uh, to appear in, in most journals that I know of, and we were already beginning to wrestle with the fact about, well, we'd have to have the web version that had all the details, and then a shorter version that would get published. I think that's wrong. I think we should shrink this back uh, based upon your good advice into a concise document, and the document will be the document. And I, it might have some sort of undergirding of uh, historical information about how we got there, but it needs to be self-contained. It need not tell the reader who goes to the journal, well, in order to really understand this, uh, you'd better go to the web. If we have to do that, then I think we've probably failed in our mission to excite the scientific community about where we're going. This is, and this came up several times, this is not a five-year plan. Uh, this is a plan of unspecified duration, just as the Alberts report really was, although it had an attempt to lay out some possible timelines. Uh, we're in a different circumstance this time, and therefore we ought to couch this document in different terminologies. And so we, I think, are going to be well served by having goals that are very ambitious, but not necessarily all of them tied to exactly the same time interval. Now, don't get me wrong. We must not shy away from defining specific deliverables when they are well suited uh, to the goals that we outline. But we shouldn't force uh, that kind of specific deliverable and timeline when it isn't a good fit uh, to the goals or the grand challenges that we think are most exciting uh, for the future of the field. There's a danger in being too specified in terms of a top-down kind of view of what the future of a field such as this is with all of the speed with which it's going to move. And so there will be some of those uh, specifics and some of those timelines uh, when we are able to do so in a fashion that is, uh, I think, uh, likely uh, to inspire uh, good scientific work, but we're not going to overdo it uh, in this particular instance. I think, again, the content of what you read in the original plan, uh, the, uh, the core points uh, will generally be preserved because they did get a positive review for the most part. Uh, but again, the formatting is going to be resolved in a fairly major way, as you saw in this uh, document, which seems to have held up pretty well throughout the course of this morning, uh, which I take it is quite a miracle with a group of this size and strong opinions, so it must be really good then. And we will uh, undoubtedly want to stick with that with perhaps some tweaking around the edges. And again, that will involve in the document focusing with more of a bright light on the core issues that are the central activities that NHGRI needs to make as their highest priorities with some of the other opportunities for partnership, of which there are many and many quite excited, exciting, included but probably moved to a different place in the document to make it clear that they're somewhat different and perhaps not outlined in as much specificity as the core elements. I think some of the things that we didn't really quite resolve, which are going to be very interesting uh, for myself and my other colleagues at NIH, and in fact in other agencies to wrestle with, are some of the opportunities that do seem very much like they are core uh, potential future actions of genomics, but probably are beyond the ability of the NHGRI to do all by ourselves. And we've had many of those in the past. We are right now engaging in this haplotype map effort, which is very much along those lines with the strong participation of uh, 18 institutes at NIH besides ourselves, 
as well as participation by the private sector. And we're going to need to continue to pursue those kinds of models for some of the things here. And I will just mention two, and one in particular because I think it was a subject of some confusion this morning and didn't get discussed as much in this meeting or in the document as perhaps the opportunity might present. And that is this whole business of providing to academic researchers the opportunity to identify affinity reagents uh, that will allow you uh, to probe a pathway uh, or to identify a particular protein in a fashion that most academic researchers do not have the chance currently to do. And that would be by the availability of large, small molecule libraries of various sorts. And I might say, I don't think that is a technology uh, which is in any way considered to be static. And while one of the ways we could do this, as put forward, I think, uh, quite uh, accurately by Alan Williamson, is to partner with the private sector to see whether access to such libraries could be obtained, I think the ways in which we make those libraries and the compounds that exist within them are going to be changing. And there's probably many possibilities in the next few years of libraries that are going to be more powerful than what anybody currently has. But if we could uh, collectively, uh, through NIH resources, work on making that kind of capability accessible uh, to an investigator who's trying to understand a pathway, we would both, I think, open a whole new window of approaches to biology and at the same time provide an opportunity to at least take the first step towards development of therapeutics in circumstances where you do have a druggable target, but perhaps the disease is not common enough to inspire much attention uh, outside of academic circles. And I, frankly, from a personal perspective, I think that that is an area which is a real paradigm shift possibility uh, from the perspective of many people who are currently working in the laboratory, including people who think them, of themselves as fairly sophisticated genomicists. And it's one that we really ought to pursue uh, with a lot more attention and intensity than has been possible up until now. Another area that I think we're really going to have to work on together uh, across the NIH and in other agencies as well is this uh, business of very large cohorts. And again, uh, I, this I will uh, say perhaps is a little bit of my own hobby horse, but I cannot imagine our getting to a point uh, five to seven years from now and looking around and not having available the opportunity to discover whether a genotype-phenotype correlation is really valid or not. It's going to be wonderful to have disease-specific cohorts collected. It was pointed out today that many of the ones that have been collected so far are probably not done in the fashion that's going to be ideal for what we want to do next with genomics. Uh, but all of those disease cohorts are, by their very definition, going to be biased. And they should be biased. If you're going to look for the genetic contribution to diabetes, you don't want to just collect any old case of diabetes. You want to load up your cases as much as you can with those that have the strongest hereditary contribution. So they're going to be the ones that have affected family members. They're going to be the ones that have an early onset. And then if you're lucky enough to find a variant that seems to be associated with disease, the immediate next question is going to be, okay, in an unbiased situation, what is uh, the relative risk uh, contributed by that allele? And if you don't have such a collection uh, that's been done in that fashion, and ideally one ought to just do this with a very large cohort that would be sufficiently large to look at most common diseases, uh, then, then we'll all be sorry. And if we don't get started on that very soon, we're going to find ourselves uh, empty-handed. Obviously, other entities are taking this on. Uh, the biobank in the United Kingdom being an example, and one that's right now mired in some controversy, but I think it's fair to say it's a very good idea, and it's, a, it's the kind of resource uh, which, if one can work through all the practical and ethical issues, uh, would provide something that would be of great benefit uh, to those who had access to it. Uh, I might just say that the biobank in the UK, if it happens, may or may not be easily accessible to US investigators, and frankly will not have the kind of diversity of participants that will help us very much at all with questions that relate to health disparities. And if that is, in fact, one of our major goals in the next few years at NIH, and I think it is and it must be, uh, then we can't count on our good colleagues in the United Kingdom to just sort of take care of this for us. We're going to have to make an investment of our own. Um, finally, uh, just to wrap this up uh, before I uh, introduce Dr. Zerhouni, I, I want to say the focus of this next plan on applications to health is not window dressing. I know it's made some people anxious at this meeting because, in fact, the glory of genomics uh, over the course of the last dozen years has largely been in what many people would describe as basic science. Uh, after all, the sequencing of the genome, our most visible flagship, uh, certainly would meet in most people's minds that description. 
But we now have an opportunity uh, to move the field in a direction that draws us much closer uh, to direct applications to human health, recognizing that we probably can't do a lot of that alone. But that second story of the house is a really important one. It's not just there as a political statement to try to protect us from being seen as perhaps somewhat less in the middle of things than we were uh, 12, uh, 10 or 12 years ago. It is a specific intentional effort uh, to change the mindset, to make it possible for people who do genomics, uh, not just to write in the first paragraph of their grant application why this might be relevant someday to a disease, but actually to be thinking about it and to be thinking about it in a regular, ongoing way and to be provided with the tools and the environment and the colleagues uh, to make that a reality in a fashion that up until now has only happened in some places at some times. And I think if we collectively uh, uh, can come to that uh, estimation and that reality, uh, that would be a great service uh, to the public who of course is expecting all of this and in fact to ourselves because I think that's where a great deal of wonderful science I is going to occur. Um, a couple other things about the roof or the penthouse or whatever we're calling uh, that third story. I want to associate myself strongly uh, with Barbara Wald's comments in her uh, presentation, although it wasn't particularly relevant to the topic she was talking about. I liked the comments a lot. Uh, and that is, I think we are in a circumstance here uh, that, we, that bears some attention. I am one of the strongest supporters you will encounter about the LC program and the wisdom that undergirded its founding uh, when the whole project got underway. And I think it has been a very successful experiment up until now in terms of connecting up research on ethical, legal, and social issues uh, with the science uh, that moves the genome forward. It is still an experiment. It is still in progress. But something has happened over the course of the last few years uh, where Elsie has taken on more of a role of the weeping prophet, the Jeremiah uh, in the circumstance, whose utterances largely are interpreted, at least, uh, by most of the scientific community as predicting doom, as basically uh, pointing towards all of the reasons why there is something to be afraid of here. And this notion of trying to couch the LC agenda in a more proactive way, a way that emphasizes the positive opportunities, is one that I think really deserves some close attention at this current time. Else we will end up in a circumstance uh, where there is even a polarization uh, between two communities that have so much to learn from each other. And here I don't mean to be just uh, saying that the LC uh, agenda uh, has turned in this direction. I think, frankly, the scientific agenda, uh, perhaps uh, for, for one reason or another, has also begin, begun to develop a bit of an attitude uh, about the way in which the LC agenda is getting in the way. And frankly, I think that is also unfortunate and needs to be uh, fought against. Uh, in, in particular, you know, we've had this uh, pre comment from several people about the way in which LC restrictions, or at least that's what they're interpreted to be, they're really IRB restrictions, uh, they're really a common rule restrictions, are getting in the way of people being able to do clinical research that they would like to do. And that is a very serious issue, and I think it is well taken that it would be a very high priority topic uh, for LC to take on an effort to try to uh, map a pathway uh, to get uh, through this particular uh, quagmire. But I think actually the answer is not to eliminate protections against misuse of, of uh, tissues, uh, lest somebody assume that that's really what's being advocated for. That will not work. We must not lose uh, the confidence of the public that we are carrying out this research in a fashion that is absolutely sensitive to their concerns about privacy and misuse of information. Frankly, I think the principles here are fairly well worked out. It's the implementation that's gotten really quite scrambled up. And if it's possible, and it, it has to be possible, for scientists and LC experts and public policy folks, uh, and yes, even the government, because HIPAA is involved in this, and certainly the IRB community, who frankly needs some help uh, trying to sort through all the differing messages that they're getting. If we can, in fact, get that all together and chart a course that maintains those principles, but deals with an implementation that it makes it possible for research to go forward in an ethical, responsible way, that would be a wonderful contribution. And I think I agree with what's been said that that ought to be a very high priority right now uh, for this community that we should all be proud of, of having built and put together where these people do all, in fact, know each other, speak to each other, and can work together uh, towards that kind of goal, which is a benevolent one with much opportunity for public good. 
Well, that's uh, enough of that little bit of a speech. Uh, let me finish uh, my remarks here by just uh, saying in a much more practical uh, way what's next uh, for this planning process. Uh, you have given us uh, wonderful ideas. Um, and I think speaking to Alan and Eric and Mark, the three Gs, as I uh, called them on Monday night, and we will continue to call them for the next few months, uh, the three of them and myself uh, will make an effort here <coughs> in the next uh, couple of weeks to try to capture uh, the, the major elements of what we have heard in this meeting and reformulate the document accordingly. Uh, and I'm not too worried about how to do that, actually. I think it's pretty clear how to do that. Uh, it's not as if we're going away going, gosh, what did they say and what do we do now? I think it's pretty clear what that pathway is. We will call upon uh, the leaders of the breakout groups, because you all were wonderfully helpful in this process, uh, to vet uh, what we come up with and see whether you think we captured it. And we may call on various other people as well as we need specific expertise. Uh, but soon after that, uh, we will then get our council subcommittee, those six people whose names I uh, mentioned to you on Monday night, uh, together uh, to see how they think we're doing. Because again, the ultimate approval of this planning document will be with the advisory council in that ultimate moment where they uh, approve, uh, hopefully, uh, not disprove, but approve this uh, is going to have to come up in February at our council meeting in our open session. At that point, then it will be probably edited a little bit more and sent off uh, for publication uh, where the rest of the world will have a chance to see what we all did uh, in April uh, in a wonderful coincidence uh, with the 50th anniversary of Watson and Crick and the completion, uh, quasi still a little bit, but less quasi than before, uh, <laughs> of the sequence of the human genome, which at that point will have all of the chromosomes in the form now already enjoyed uh, by 2021 and 22 and many others yet to come in the very near future. So that's the pathway we're on. And again, some of you will get a chance uh, to see these revisions. We probably won't ask all 160 of you to do so because then we'd probably fall into that same uh, situation of too many uh, cooks in the stew. But I think we've heard you. And I hope you also uh, will recognize that we have recorded uh, your thoughts in all of the ways uh, that our uh, staff have been able to do during the breakout sessions and all of this uh, and plenary material, which is on videotape so we can go back and uh, recover uh, your wise comments. And by the way, I would like to be sure all of the people who presented this morning uh, make their PowerPoints uh, available uh, to the three Gs so that we have those as well because there's some very good things in there and I don't want to lose them. So that's the path we're on. And again, I, I would like to say this has been an incredible kind of gathering, uh, a gathering where we managed to bring together, I think probably the largest uh, intellectual collection of people thinking about the genome in a very long time. Uh, some uh, folks who were here were, in fact, I think quite impressed to see uh, the diversity of expertise, but also the depth of expertise uh, represented uh, by this particular set of attendees. Uh, and it's been rough and tumble, and that's exactly the way it always should be uh, when we're talking about the genome. And I think the outcome of this is going to be a dramatic improvement on, on uh, where we thought we were uh, three days ago. And uh, I hope you will all feel, by, uh, by the fact that you were here, a sense of ownership, because that is our intention, that this is not just a plan of some government agency. Uh, this is a plan of the genome community, uh, jointly generated uh, by all of you together uh, here at Early House, and then put out for the rest of the world uh, to hopefully have them take ownership of it as well. So thank you for your very, very important contributions to this, and I would now like to go on and introduce the final speaker uh, of the meeting, uh, my new boss, uh, Dr. Elias Zerhouni. Uh, Dr. Zerhouni has been here this morning and uh, uh, listening to all of the uh, inputs. Uh, I, it's probably a good thing that he didn't prepare his remarks ahead of time based on the documents I gave him last week. <laughs> In fact, uh, Dr. Zerhouni is the kind of NIH director who was preparing animated PowerPoints uh, sitting next to me this morning while you all were talking, so he's very much on top of the technology of immediate response, which is, which is a good thing in this kind of gathering. Uh, I must say from a personal perspective, uh, his arrival on the scene uh, only about six months ago has been a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing for NIH. Uh, Elias comes to us uh, from a previous role as executive vice dean at Hopkins. Uh, he has great uh, and uh, deep experience in how academic institutions of very high caliber operate and sometimes how they don't operate and have to be fixed. 
and he has brought that expertise, uh, both in terms of science and in terms of management of a large and complicated organization, uh, to NIH uh, with great energy, and it, uh, it has been an absolute delight uh, to have him present uh, in our midst uh, for these last six months. One of his very first priorities has been uh, to try to chart uh, a course for all of NIH in the next uh, coming years, uh, which is now being referred to as a roadmap, and he has uh, vigorously brought into that set of discussions uh, a number of senior figures in the scientific community, some of whom have also been at this meeting. Uh, and it's interesting to contemplate how that exercise, which basically tries to look at all of biomedical research, uh, overlaps uh, in many interesting ways with what we've been trying to do here in a much more focused way in the field of genomics. And so I was particularly pleased that despite his many uh, commitments, he was willing uh, and able uh, to clear off uh, this morning uh, to come and be with us. And I'd now like to invite him to come and tell you uh, what he thinks about all of this and anything else that's on his mind. Elias. Thank you, Francis. You know, it's interesting. When you become director of NIH, they invite you a lot to give either opening remarks or closing remarks. And, uh, and I'm wondering always what's best. Actually, opening remarks are not bad because nobody has talked about the subject yet. You welcome everybody, and everything you say is relevant. Closing remarks are really a lot harder, <laughs> especially with an assembly like this one. You've done a lot of work. I was trying to get a little briefing about what happened during the past two days, and I heard that there were a lot of, lots of fights, and I said, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and especially following you know, my predecessor, Harold, and, uh, and, and also recognizing all the good work he's done to bring genomics to the point uh, genomics uh, are today, and also looking at how great he looks, I'm becoming optimistic again. <laughs> 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 And especially that uh, after that, I could probably take nine years in India to do. Uh... <laughs> but the most challenging thing was really to follow Francis. As you know, Francis has an analytical, analytical mind that is very comprehensive, and it's very hard to follow Francis. Um, do I have these slides on? Or? Yeah, they're all down. Okay. So what I wanted to do really was not, um, not to you know, summarize or, or try to, to, to say something that uh, would be over um, rep repetitive, but try to say some to, to share with you the lessons I'm uh, receiving, not just from this morning, but over uh, the six months that I've had uh, at the NIH, and share with you some of my own approach to what we're, we're uh, talking about here, and some of my concepts that relate fundamentally to the maturity of this field, and what it is that you can extract from it that will teach us how to go forward. Um, it, is a, it, is a, it is a challenge, because I think what uh, we're experiencing here is a, a meeting of, you know, experts, and you've gone through all of the issues, and one of the things that I find quite interesting is the, the boldness of all the proposals and the depth of, of, uh, of everybody's, uh, everybody's comments. So let, just, let me just share some comments with you on, on, a, um, on an informal basis. And again, as, as, uh, as, <laughs> as uh, Francis was saying, I put these slides together between, uh, in the coffee break, so forgive me if they're not complete or if there are misspellings. Um, my first reaction really coming down from Washington is, what am I going to say uh, that's worth saying after, after your meeting? And I said, my first reaction would be to be speechless. It's probably the best thing to do. But for those of you who know me, I can't remain speechless for too long. So um, clearly, um, what you've developed is a bold and comprehensive plan. And, and I'm, I'm really genome-wide, I understand. David Botstein wants me to use that word, so I'm using that word. Um, but really, the interesting thing is you've used an analogy that, that I have a little bit of uh, difficulty with, and that's the analogy of the house. In fact, I think in genomics, what we're seeing is the result of a seed that was planted um, many years ago. And if you think about that image, that seed has grown. And in, in my mind, I see it more as an arborization. What you're witnessing here at Early 2 is an arborization of the field into completely different importance and directions. To me, it's more like a neuron, actually. Think of a stem neuron 
that has evolved and has grown its axon and now is developing synapses and dendrites for, to the rest of the system. So in fact, you're clearly uh, dealing with a formidable problem, a formidable reverse engineering problem, which is at the core of biology. And it is going to permeate through these arborizations every other field of science. And we need to tackle it together. And it's going to be much larger than H NHGRI. It's going to be all of NIH, all of the world, actually. And we ra realize that. Now, the reverse engineering problem, you know, I and mean, all the analogies about parts list and how parts function and so on. You've heard those. I'm not going to repeat them. But it is a powerful analogy because, frankly, it is the most formidable problem mankind has ever known of reverse engineering. When you look at the complexity of a single cell with a billion molecules and billions of cells and you try to compute that, you realize that we've never faced a problem like this in the history of science. In fact, as we are disturbing our environment, our, as we are changing the ecology of the Earth and our own relationships to the environment, Mastering this problem may actually be the future or the lack thereof of our societies. So it is a national priority in my mind, and I say that very, very clearly, because if you do not master life sciences in the next 25, 50 years, what you're going to see is a humongous impact because of the cost of disease and the cost of disease worldwide on political stability, societal stability, our ability to fund education, and as you know, an educated public is a public that supports knowledge. And all of those things are incredibly dependent on your work. And we need to understand the big picture here. So what, you've, what you're doing really in my mind is an arborization that is permeating the entire process, uh, the thought process of all of bioscience. And one of the things that I keep hearing and I kept hearing this morning is this issue of overwhelming scale and complexity. And uh, it's too complex, too many data points. What do we know with, what do we do with them? Not enough bioinformatics, not enough computing. Well, let me just give you a perspective that comes from my personal um, uh, training. And as I was coming uh, this morning, I was thinking about what, what example can I give you that will make the point I'm trying to make? And the best example I could come up with is my combination padlock. When I go to the YMCA <laughs> to swim, I have a four digit padlock and if you know your mathematics, you know there are 10,000 combinations. So it could be 9999 or 000 and everything in between. So you have about 10,000 possibilities, very complex. But my code is 6398. Six, three, six, I'm telling you what the code is. <laughs> you need to have better, better sequencing capabilities. <laughs> But anyway, here's my code, 6398. So it's one of 10,000. Now you're facing the problem of figuring out what was in my mind when I made that code, and why is that code that code? And could you really open my locker if I challenged you to do that? Well, you could, really. There are 10,000 combinations. You still will have to use the brute force approach that you hear, and that is that accumulate all the data, put databases, and find correlations. Well. But if you knew how I came up with that code, I can show you how the scale and complexity of the problem can reduce itself by orders of magnitude. So here's how I came up with this code. The way I do it, so I can't, uh, as I said, 10,000 possibilities, so I don't, I don't forget the code, is I have a little routine in my mind when I make these codes. And I say, all right, I'm going to take the first number, and I divide it by 2. So I pick 6, divide by 2, becomes 3. And I said, the next operation is multiply that number by 3. So it becomes 9. And then I remove 1. And that's how I remember it, because otherwise I would have forgotten it. <laughs> but you, you're going to say, <coughs> no. But you see, Eric is a, Eric is a good uh, mathematician. So Eric is going to say, well, but, but how does that really help your memory? Well, I'll show you why it helps your memory. Now, if I ask you the question, how many co combinations there are in 10,000 possibilities that would fit divide by 2, multiply by 3, minus 1? Anybody has the answer, Eric? Half? Half? Ten. Ten? Did you pick the first digit after that? All fit. Oh, you can round down? Do you round them up? Okay, who says less than five? Five. Well, five is the obsession. 
you vote now. Five or less than five? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Eric. Three. Why is it three? Because obviously you have, if you start by divide by two, you can only have an even number. And so four, two, four is four, divided by two is two, and then my three is six, and then five. And then you can have another one, two. You can start with two. Two and one and three and two, because you divide by two, multiply by three, remove one. But what about eight? Can't work. Because eight divided by two is four, multiplied by three is 12, out of range. So it doesn't work. So I can show you here in a simple example that, in fact, the challenge that we have is to, there's too, too much animation here. <laughs> <laughs> but there are three possibilities, as Aravinda said, and, and uh, a huge reduction in complexity. I'm sorry? No, because 0 divided by 2 is 0. 0 multiplied by 3 is 0. 0 uh, minus 1 is minus 1. And I don't have minus one on my padlock. <laughs> <laughs> so what it is that I think the challenge in front of you is, in my mind, is that you have succeeded in essentially growing a new field. And you have an identity crisis or problem or issue that you have to resolve. Is the field a discipline or is the field a tool for many other disciplines? And that, to me, define, is, is the challenge. The complexity you're facing will define, will require you as scientists to define operating rules of the system. Because every operating rule of the system you can find reduces complexity by orders of magnitude. The second is that you have to understand the interelemental functions. And I heard that about um, uh, functional genomics and understanding c connected gene elements that are now, forgive me, I'm a radiologist, so not, not, it's not my field, but, but you see what I'm trying to say. You're really trying to bring families of genes that interact, inter, and interact through functions that you could quantify. And then you have to be really, uh, in terms of understanding scale and, compl and complexity, you have to be able to perturb the system in a way that is measurable and that you have observations that stack, collect, connect with the perturbation and that's, that is why you're hearing these ideas about molecules for research, molecular libraries that will allow you to quantifiably um, change the, the parameters of the system so you can extract from there the inter-elemental functions. And more, uh, most importantly, I think you need sufficient data density. I think, in my mind, what I think the field is, 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 is facing is truly an information theory problem. And let me just show you this. Now, again, these are rough graphics, let's see if I gave you a data point, like this circle here, that had a cloud of uncertainty around it. Now you weren't sure exactly where the point was, but it's certainly a point in the universe of data. And I asked you, what do you think this represents? There's no answer to that, but I give you a second one. And then, is this part of a line? Or is this part of a circle? Or two eyes and Mickey Mouse? I don't know. Now I give you a third one. What is that? Tough to say. And I'll give you a fourth one. What is that? Still tough to say. And the problem in information theory is that you need both data density and data quality. In fact, if I showed you what it is that I intended to, to form here, I could ask you to give me the, the shape I had in mind, and you'll probably come up with 10 answers. But if I gave you more data points, all of a sudden you realize I was thinking about a rectangle. And the rectangle, to get to the rectangle, you really need to have data points that have a lot less uncertainty around the, the, the point and many more points. How you accumulate that data in genomics is going to be your challenge. And fundamentally, to me, I need to understand how you want to go about it. Because I know one thing, if you use brute force, it will cost us 10,000 more dollars than if you use intelligent force. And I think that's one area of the science that I think you need to promote. And that is that modeling and capability of redu reduction in complexity and defining the, the key parameters, uh, observable parameters that you need to come up with, with the solution. And you need three things. You need density, you need quality, but you also need temporal resolution, which really comes to the issue of quantum jumps in technologies 
that we need to accomplish for you to be able to do this. Now, uh, Francis uh, mentioned, I have to say something about what I've been doing for six months. Uh, so Francis mentioned the roadmap priorities, and it's interesting, there, 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 there are four of them. And they seem to permeate the entire NIH and permeate all the fields that we're talking about. But they're also stemming very, very strongly from genomics. And those are emerging research technologies and resources, and you've talked about them, RNAi libraries or very advanced imaging capabilities at the molecular level, single cell, three-dimensional structure needs to be understood. The relationship of structure to function needs to be understood. We don't have the tools right now to do this. We need to, to, to evaluate them. And then new pathways to discovery. And again, what I just described in terms of mathematical treatments of an information field is in fact a way to have a new pathway uh, to discover new things. The idea of comparing the healthy to unhealthy is a means to discovery. It's not a field in itself, but it's a step in the discovery process. Now the third one, which I think is very important to you, is misspelled re-engineering uh, of the clinical enterprise. I really don't believe at this point that we have a clinical research enterprise in the country that will support your dream. You've heard cohorts, you've heard the ability to share data, uh, you have the ability to in fact interoperate clinical trials. No, actually other countries have more advanced capabilities than we do. So I think one of the issues we have to look at and I'm looking at is how can we re-engineer the clinical research enterprise to serve the new opportunities in science, which we never had before. Ten years ago, you wouldn't have had to have that discussion as you had it today. In addition, human subject protections are coming to the fore. And in addition, the privacy protections are coming to the fore. And I have trouble seeing how the research enterprise will serve science if it is not redesigned in a way that provides firewalls around these issues of privacy. Now, you thought that gene data banking was, was a difficult issue, and you had Bermuda 1, and you may have to have Bermuda 2 again uh, to talk about it some more. But uh, let me tell you, the difficulties you're going to have in terms of human data and uh, biological samples are going to be even more daunting. And I think you need to be proactive about this and, and, and go forward. And last but not least is the scientific team of the future, and we're obviously on the same wavelength. You're talking about multidisciplinary research. It's clearly uh, the few, the, an issue that we need to talk. One of the sentences I came up with is as we were talking about, uh, let's sequence more genomes. Let's talk about variation. Really what we're looking at in the next phase is to go from the human genome to understanding the genome of all humans. And that is a challenge I think that early two needs to place on the table. Because I agree, the specificity of the goal of the human genome process was a, was a terrific move. And you need to stay there because it is more challenging now to uh, obtain funding and convince Congress, convince the public that we need to have continued funding, that the genome is not the end of the road, it's the beginning of the road. And that requires public trust. And one of the things I would like to emphasize, and I know you have emphasized, is the public trust is paramount. And uh, when you look at public trust, what is that? In fact, the, the most important definition I've heard of public trust is the ability to predict someone's behavior. And the public wants to have the ability to predict our system's behavior, the system of research and our thought process, the system of science. Because if they can't, if it's unpredictable, then they will lose trust. And trust is based also on education, because an educated public is a trusting public. They understand, at the end of the day, what are the pros and cons. Look at uh, what happened in Zambia, where uh, genetically modified foods were turned down by a starving population. Ignorance is what the, is the enemy. So we have to be hypersensitive to our diversity. I, I just want to emphasize that. And I think you have, you have emphasized the issue, the consideration of moral and ethical implications. So uh, I know we're on time. 
I didn't want to, as you can see, I don't remain speechless for a long time. <laughs> uh, but I think I wanted to share where I was in, in this process. As a new director, is challenging sometimes. Uh, I, uh, I have to say that uh, I have a very well varmed seat where I am, <laughs> thanks to Dr. Varmus. And he has done an outstanding job in preparing the field. I think it's our challenge to go forward and to develop, de develop it further with vision across NIH and really across the entire disciplines of uh, biomedical sciences. I'm in for the game. I see that Dr. Insel, our new director of the National Institute of Mental Health, is here. And I'm going to borrow one of his sentence, uh, sentences when I introduced him to the advisory council. He said he came to NIH fired with enthusiasm and was hoping not to be fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I share his view. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you, Elias, for a very uh, provocative, uh, thoughtful, and sophisticated analysis of some of the major issues. I think you put your finger squarely uh, on a number of the things that we are facing in the next few years, and it's wonderful to have uh, your very thoughtful analysis resonating uh, so deeply with what I think all of us are hoping for the future. And, and partnership with you and the rest of NIH is going to be crucial if these dreams are going to come true. So that's a fitting finale, I think, uh, to a really <laughs> remarkable couple of days. Uh, I want to uh, thank all of you one more time uh, for the time and energy you've put into this, particularly to thank those who performed in leadership roles, and for me to thank Alan uh, and Eric and Mark uh, for all of their hard work and for all of the NHGRI staff who performed in various ways as scribes, as well as uh, running around doing a host of other things, and there uh, particularly uh, Susan Vasquez uh, for many of the logistical issues that were so smoothly handled, one of which is that I have a note in front of me to say that the Dulles van uh, that's supposed to leave at 1230 is waiting outside and ready to go. And so with that, those of you who are wanting to stay for lunch, it is now served downstairs. Uh, please go downstairs and continue your conversations. Those of you who have to go, Godspeed to all of you, and we'll try to make the best of all of your wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you.